Son Excellence, Madame la Présidence de la République de Moldova. The colleagues, um, all here uh, physically present in the hemicycle and uh, on your screens remotely, Madam Secretary General, Madam Secretary General, um, colleagues, uh, ambassadors, um, permit me to welcome Her Excellency the President of Moldova, Madam Sandu. Uh, welcome to our Assembly Chamber. We are very honored to have you among us in uh, what we tend to call Europe's House of Democracy. Um, we're very pleased that you found time in your busy agenda to address the Assembly and exchange views with our parliamentarians. Um, as you know, we, we have a little bit of a small rule that please allow our colleagues uh, in the hemicycle and remotely to be able to put some questions to you. We've got one full hour, so if we could distribute a little bit the time. Uh, allow me also to, congratu to congratulate you on your election, being a first female president of the Republic of Moldova, I've been told. Uh, which is a very welcome development as regards that uh, more women leaders and a more balanced representation of women in politics in our member states, so I'm quite keen on that. Uh, I also would like to commend you on the priorities of your mandate, the fight against corruption, the promotion of transparency in elections, reform of the justice sector, all very important issues for the functioning of democratic societies. Um, the importance of uh, partnership and dialogue between us, the Parliamentary Assembly, and our member states is obviously very important, and we do play a key role as Assembly in advancing political parliamentary dialogue on a pan-European level, more specifically in this case uh, with your country. And we look forward to hearing your views on the current political developments, progress, and challenges with regard to upholding and strengthening human rights, fundamental freedoms, and the function of democratic institutions in your country. As we know, this is uh, a little bit complicated for the moment, but we will hear from you and, of course, as well as the advancement of European integration. So, without due delay, Madam President, it is my pleasure, my honor to give you the floor. Please take the floor. Dear Mr. President, dear Ms. Secretary General of the Council of Europe, dear Mr. Secretary, um, Dear Ms. Secretary General of PACE, uh, dear Mr. Deputy Secretary General, dear members of the Parliamentary Assembly, Excellencies, thank you for the invitation to address you here today at Palais de l'Europe. I'm grateful for the opportunity to meet you in person, and I also warmly greet the audience and the Parliamentary Assembly's delegates who have joined online. I stand here today to acknowledge the role of the Council of Europe in establishing and upholding the values and standards that define European nations today, in promoting democrat democratic consolidation, stability, and providing a place for a dialogue on the continent. Moldova is a small European nation of kind and hardworking people who will celebrate 30 years of independence this August. It's a country which has all the ingredients for success. I'm honored to be, the elect to be elected the president of this country. In truth, recent presidential elections united Moldovans of all ethnicities around a core demand for an accountable, responsive government which will pursue national, not personal, interests. This shared goal created an unprecedented wave of unity and purpose, and this is my key message today. The will to reform the country comes from the Moldovan people. Moldovans of different ages, of different political preferences, came together as one nation 
to demand far-reaching internal transformations, including a serious fight against corruption, justice sector reforms, and a clean government which works for the people. And I have this message to all Moldovans. I will do what you have told me to do. You generated the momentum for reforms, and it must now be sustained by real actions. Words and promises, nice documents of which the Moldovans have had so many, will not be enough. 30 years ago, Moldova chose the path of building its own democracy. We adopted a constitution, voted laws, and established institutions inspired from the best European and international practices. We did many things right, but a lot remained on paper. Despite prolonged reforms, despite increasingly sophisticated legislation, many of our institutions remain vulnerable to undue influence and are prone to abuse. State institutions today are often unable to deliver quality public services. The economy suffers from monopolies. Some people lose hope in the day of tomorrow and choose to leave the country in search of a better future. People voted for a serious, cha serious change. But what exactly does change mean for Moldovans? It means that Moldovans want justice. We want better standards of living, access to quality education and health care, and better infrastructure. We want a country with a real economy, where foreign and domestic investments feel secure, where there are jobs for all. We want our people to choose to return and live in Moldova, not because they have to, but because they want to. Change means that Moldovans will trust their state. People's vision for a better future is built on several key elements. Genuine fight against corruption, functioning laws, an accountable and independent judiciary, a good business climate, a better environment, developed infrastructure, and good education and healthcare systems. These are my strategic priorities. The first priority is to put an end to pervasive corruption. Corruption arrests democracy, erodes the public sector and state-owned enterprises. Public officials are not held accountable for their actions, and those who should stop abusers, judges, prosecutors, law enforcement officials, are in many cases the offenders. As a result, we see growing distrust between the state and the citizens. According to international assessments, Moldova faces close to $1 billion per year in illicit financial flows, uh, flows through corruption, money laundering, and smuggling. This is a huge amount for my country. Only a fraction of this money would be enough to double the salaries of teachers or repair most roads in the country. Moldovans are hardworking people. The money that Moldovans earn should go to increase the benefits of all, not construct mansions for corrupt officials. Moldova's key challenges today is to create an efficient, democratic state where everyone would know that their hard work pays off to them personally and contributes to the welfare of all. The people of Moldova elected me their president with a strong mandate to fight corruption and open the doors to fundamental transformation inside the country. And this is my first and most important priority. This task cannot be achieved by just one institution, no matter how determined it is. There has to be a common sense of purpose in fighting corruption between the presidency, the parliament, and the government. Early parliamentary elections, which will take place soon in Moldova, will open the doors to this change of political personalities who are running the country. The forthcoming elections will give us a unique opportunity to pursue a serious reform agenda, to step again on the path towards democracy and restore trust between the people and the state. 
Second, we must reform justice. It is a foundation for increasing investments in Moldova's economy, both local and international, and bolster the efficiency of the public sector. Everybody in Moldova must be treated equally. For too long, the few have had it all from the state, and the many have had very little. An entrepreneur who has been construct constructing a strong business during his or her whole life only to see it taken away by those from high-level offices because they wanted the profits that the business generates. Courts that adjudicate cases in favor of those with power and money and treat people without connections unfairly or support a corrupt official who snatches government property through affiliated companies in front of everyone's eyes. Judges who close their eyes on cases of flagrant corruption and absolve high-placed criminals from responsibility. We must change that. The business person is the backbone of Moldova's economic growth, and he or she should have exactly the same treatment as the powerful national officials. Everyone in Moldova must know that the state and its justice system will treat them fairly. This is the goal of our justice sector reform, which will increase citizens' trust in government institutions. Third, a less corrupt state and an impartial independent judiciary will create a strong foundation for a functional economy and economic growth. This, in turn, will generate budget revenues to rebuild Moldova's crippling infrastructure. But most importantly, this national revenue that will be taken away from regional criminal networks and corrupt officials will allow a cleaner Moldovan government to do what it should have been done over these 30 years of independence, invest in Moldova's key national asset, the human capital. We must significantly increase our investment in better education and quality health care, and we must guarantee decent social support for the Moldovan people. This is, in a few words, the vision for the country and the program of reforms which all Moldovans want, no matter whether they speak Romanian, Ukrainian, Russian, Gagauz, or Bulgarian. This is the common purpose and the core agenda which has united all Moldovans. Ladies and gentlemen, this hall has seen many speeches, visionary, inspiring messages of hope, unity, progress, and peace. My message today is different. The Moldovan people want the presidency to join forces with the new parliament and the new government to clean the country of the vices that are holding it back. And I ask for your support in doing so. And this time, Moldovan politicians should not fail the people. Rebuilding trust between the state and the citizens is not an easy task, but it must be accomplished as a fundamental precondition for a happier, more prosperous nation. While this trust may be a global phenomenon in today's world, worsened by the pandemic and compet competing narratives, the key to fixing the fabric of Moldovan society is in Moldova by tackling corruption, reforming justice, creating accountability in our public sector, and investing in education, healthcare, and social protection, we can reconnect our institutions with our people. The power of institutions doesn't lie only in the words of the law that describe their attributions and competences. Their power lies in the dedication with which their employees choose to do their work every day. It resides in the quality of the services provided to the citizen, in the professionalism of the clerk at the counter, in the clarity of the procedures, in the behavior of the patrol policeman on the road, in the stubbornness with which a prosecutor defends the public good from the actions of an immoral official in the strength with which a judge chooses not to answer the phone if someone influential 
is calling to intervene in a case. Public servants need to know that they are in the service of the people. What we set out to do requires courage and continued sustained effort. The drive for reforms must continue to come from the people, no matter what obstacles might block the road. And there are many obstacles. Corrupt forces will fight back because they stand to lose not only their illicit revenues, but also their freedom. But people are determined to fight for change and count on the support of Moldova's partners at the Council of Europe. In the past 26 years, the Council of Europe played a crucial role in helping Moldova transition to a more democratic system of governance. The Council of Europe and its institutions, the Parliamentary Assembly, the Council of Ministers, the Venice Commission, the Congress of Local Authorities, and others stood beside Moldova in good and bad times. Thank you for all the support you have given our country in our difficult moments. Ladies and gentlemen, I put restoring citizens' trust in the state and the fight against corruption at the centre of my address today, because they are key to ensuring stability and security in our broader region. Corruption is a security issue, and it does not stop at Moldova's borders. Smuggling, money laundering, hybrid threats are all transnational threats. We see that many countries in the Eastern Europe are also struggling with weak rule of law and weak institutions. This increases our collective insecurity in the region. I understand that there is fatigue in Europe of a prolonged democratic transformation. People in my country are also tired of hearing about never-ending reforms and failed attempts at better life for all. Genuine transformations require a strong political will, and this political will to reform is present in Moldova today. If we plant the seeds, we will provide for a better future for our children. And we could focus more on what really matters for, for our future, strengthening environmental and climate res resilience, supporting digital transformation, enhancing connectivity, and promoting fair and inclusive, inclusive society, our common European priorities. Today, my country needs help. The Moldovan people are determined to bring it back on track and make it work for them. The Moldovan people want to be able to say with pride, this is our, this is our state. This might seem difficult to do, but Moldovans as a people can do and have done impossible things. We might be a young and fragile democracy but we have always been a diverse, open, resourceful, and fair nation. Despite previous setbacks, we can turn our fate around and make our country prosperous. Where there is popular will, there is change. Where there is political will, there is genuine reform. It is time for Moldovans to have a decent life at home. And we will achieve this together as a nation, as a country, and as a family of nations united in our desire for democracy and the rule of law here in this key European forum, the Council of Europe. Thank you. Thank you, Madam President. We have 35 minutes and even more for questions. Thank you for that, because, of course, all of our members are very eager to have some questions to you. In order of procedure, just for everyone to know, we will take five questions at a time, after which, Madam President, you have the occasion of answering. The more concise, obviously, the questions and the answers are, the more colleagues we can have on board in order to uh, put these questions to you. Uh, we normally start with the representatives of the political groups. These are five. After these five, Madam President, you will have the floor to answer, and then we go further overstaking five by five. Uh, so there's one more one by the group leaders. Okay, so we'll do that. So 
Uh, as opposed to what I just was telling you, the group leaders want to have a question you have to answer because otherwise it gets mixed, apparently. Let's start off with the socialist group. We've got Stefan Schenach. Stefan, you are in the room, I think. There you are. You have the floor. One minute. Hello, M Mrs. President. Good to see you here and not only many times in Chisinau. Congratulations for your speech. I will not ask you uh, regarding the next movement of your constitutional court, which give you the power to make new election. I'm not asking you about the children without parents on the street and not about the pandemic of corruption, which you named so many times. I'm the last one who chaired on the Council of Europe the talks between Transnistria and Moldova in January 2018. And the atmosphere was so good that uh, I want to ask you what has happened now in the relation between Transnistria and Moldova? Are you ready to go into a federation? And the last question, uh, how, what you will do that the rights of the minority of the Gagaus are more in your constitution? Uh, thank you, Madam President. You have the floor. Thank you. Um, I don't know what steps you were referring uh, back in 2018, uh, but I can tell you that uh, we are doing our best uh, to improve the lives of our citizens on the left bank. Uh, unfortunately, people uh, on the right bank and on the left bank face similar poverty issues, corruption issues. In addition to that, people on the left bank uh, face uh, additional problems. Uh, there is not uh, an immediate solution to the conflict in Transnistria, but there is a need for us to do whatever it takes to provide for uh, good uh, living conditions and to uh, ensure the respect for human rights. And this is one of the concerns that we have, one of the main concerns that we have now with respect to, the, uh, to our citizens in the uh, Transnistrian region. Uh, I can tell you that we've been uh, concerned and we've been doing uh, whatever we can, including during the pandemic, uh, to provide for the vaccine. So every time we will secure some vaccines, because this has been uh, pretty difficult uh, for Moldova, we will, every time we will donate the vaccines uh, for the left bank. You know that we uh, don't have a functional government and for more specific, more serious steps to be taken, we do need to have a functional government and a majority in the parliament which will support these actions. We have been discussing, including with the uh, uh, OSCE uh, about these issues. We have been uh, discussing to have in the second half of the year the next meeting of the 5 plus 2, which is the format where we um, approach or where we discuss the main issues. But again, uh, the uh, security, the human rights, uh, the uh, uh, problems of the people on the left bank has been on our agenda. And when we have more uh, political stability, I think we'll have a better chance to advance on these issues. Thank you, ma'am. And uh, about the uh, uh, minorities, you mean the, the Gagauz uh, problems. Uh, again, uh, Gagauz is part of uh, Moldova and everything we do um, with respect to our citizens is also with respect to the citizens of Kagauzia. I can tell you uh, that we are currently working the office of the uh, presidency on a program uh, to improve the studying of the Gagauz language uh, together with the uh, improving the studying of the Romanian language for the uh, people in Gagauzia. So this is a specific issue that we are trying to address now. Um, and otherwise, of course, we're discussing other issues related to, uh, to the uh, problems in the region, but uh, this is going uh, pretty well. Thank you, Madam President. We now move to the question for EPP, which is uh, Inese Libina Ignere. Inese, remotely, please request the floor. Has this happened? Inese, you have the floor.
We were trying to get Inese on board. This is, excuse us, uh, Madam President, the hiccups of the remote meetings. Maybe we take Mr. Uh, Ikitian, the times is connected. Yeah. He's here. Okay. okay, so we will go now to, uh, no, voilà, Inese is there. If we got the screen. Voila, um, Inese, you got the floor. Excuse me, there was some, un, un, really, can't understand the technical problems, but Your Excellency, Madam Sandu, um, your election as the president of Moldova signals the willingness of majority of people to continue with the pro-European reforms. And we support your reform agenda and Moldova's efforts on the European path. And in your view, Madam President, what should be the most essential steps to be made now to deal with the acute socioeconomic and healthcare challenges in the country? while taking into account also the current legal and political situation. Thank you. Thank you, Inese. Madam President. Thank you. Uh, of course, there is a sanitary crisis. And uh, as I have said, the biggest challenge for us has been getting access to the vaccine. It's not easy for a small country um, to uh, be able to buy, I'm not even talking about donations, though uh, we are very grateful for the donations that we have received, but this has been the main challenge, uh, getting the access to vaccine, and we're still uh, trying to solve this issue, because this will also help economically. Unfortunately, the, the government hasn't been providing economic support, especially the small and medium enterprises have been um, affected dramatically. Uh, I personally have suggested several um, policy actions, including uh, establishing uh, um, a, a fund to uh, guarantee credits for small and medium businesses. But uh, this hasn't been uh, supported by the current parliament. So uh, our businesses are on, on their own. And the sooner we solve the uh, political crisis and the sooner we have a new parliament, uh, we can count on a government which is going to, to help. Uh, moreover, unfortunately, the current parliament has done everything to block the external funding. Uh, so the decisions, the laws that the current parliament has voted against, I mean, after the presidential elections, uh, went against all the commitments that we have uh, with respect to the IMF, to the EU, to the World Bank. So in this difficult situation, the country cannot access almost any uh, external funding. And you can imagine how bad this is for the, uh, for the local businesses, because uh, when you don't have this uh, external funding, you can't help uh, poor people and you cannot help the economy. So I hope that uh, we will be able to solve the political situation, uh, that the parliamentary elections are going to happen soon enough, and then the new government is going to restore the access to external funding and is going to come up with uh, specific programs to both support the economy, but also the poor people, those affected by the uh, pandemics. Thank you, Madam President. We now move to the question for ALDE, which is Johanna Zigitian. I think, Johannes, you are in the room. Okay, Johannes, you got the floor. Mike. It works now. Uh, Your Excellency, Madam President, welcome to the cradle of democracy and human rights. So, uh, as you see, we are, of course, following the processes in Moldova and situation also uh, as well in Trans Transnistria, dialogue called 5 plus, plus 2. We consider very important that your statement on the activation and functionality of this process and your um, um, ad adherence to an exclusively peaceful settlement of this issue. And as you said, uh, there is some political complement, but, uh, component, but also uh, there are a lot of everyday legal, humanitarian, and social aspects. Uh, one of the key principles of Council of Europe is that all our values, conventions, and resolutions should be available to everyone uh, who lives in any part of its border. And that's why I took a short question. What we can do together to make our values and principles work fully also on the territory of Trans uh, Transnistria, and how to make sure that people living there do not feel isolated from the Council of Europe processes. Thank you. Thank you, Johannes, Madam President.
Thank you. Indeed, uh, the peaceful settlement of the conflict is the main principle of uh, looking and searching for the solution. Uh, and and uh, by the way, I, uh, I wanted to comment on the previous question that the federalization is not a solution that we support. Um, we are looking for a solution and uh, all the political forces uh, have come together to work on this solution. In the meantime, there are uh, urgent issues that need to be tackled, and I mentioned one of it is the human rights issues on the uh, uh, territory of the Transnistria, Transnistria uh, region, and this is one of the area where we haven't been very successful in tackling the, the problem, and we do need the uh, support of the international community. Uh, on the other areas, we do have successful uh, cases. For instance, uh, the Transnistrian region benefits from the free trade regime with the EU, and this uh, has proved to be a very beneficial uh, development. And uh, we have uh, uh, a lot of uh, the trade uh, by Transnistria going to with the EU. But uh, when it comes to more sensitive issues, as I said, for instance, the, the issue of, uh, of human rights, um, then uh, here we do need uh, the support uh, and the support of the Council of Europe, the support of OECE, OEC, of course, would be much appreciated. Thank you, Madam President. We now move to the question for the European Conservatives. Uh, remotely, John Howell. John, I see you now. John, you've got the floor. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. President. Uh, ma ma Madam President, uh, that, that was a, a brilliant speech. Um, I, 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 Moldova may be a small country, but it has an important geopolitical position. H has your election and your uh, orientation towards the West and, and to uh, curing, curing the country from, from corruption uh, caused a problem uh, with, uh, with, with, with the Russian Federation? And do you think that the election of a pro-Western and, and uh, a group of MPs that follow your line is going to cause further problems with the Russian Federation? Thank you very much. Uh, I wouldn't say that uh, my elections has been causing problems with relations to, in relations with the Russian Federation. Of course, we have a pretty uh, serious agenda to solve, uh, which is about trade, uh, which is about Transnistria, uh, the weapons, uh, the Russian army. So this agenda is still there. It's not an easy agenda, but I wouldn't say that there have been serious changes. I do want to say that we are concerned with uh, the developments in the region, and I do want to say that we uh, would like to have the chance to uh, focus on our internal reforms. I just spoke about the tremendous challenges that we're facing in the country, and we would like to, to have the opportunity to, to focus on our internal uh, reforms um, and, and enjoy uh, an environment in, re in the region which would be conducive to these reforms. Thank you, Madam President. We now move to UEL. I think Tini is in the room. Tini, you've got the floor. Madam President, good to see you here. We often talk about big countries, but the smaller member states of, uh, of the Council of Europe are uh, as relevant as, uh, as these bigger ones. You said, Madam President, that since your election five months ago, uh, Moldova does not have a functioning government. As far as I can see, the, uh, the candidate that you want to form a government has been rejected twice by the majority of parliament, and the candidate that the parliament proposes has been rejected by you. And now you have dissolved the parliament that went counter to the advice of the Venice Commission, but your constitutional court supported you, so you will have elections. But what, Madam President, if the result of these parliamentary elections again create a situation that you are the president, but there is another majority in the parliament. Is this becoming a big battle between a presidential system and a parliamentary system in your country? As far as I know, your constitution says that you are a parliamentary, parliamentary uh, democracy. Could you elaborate on that? How can we, in the end, solve the problem in, in less of uh, creating it time and uh, time and again, and dissolving the, the parliament again and again. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you, Tini, Madam President. Thank you. Um, it's our uh, task to offer the people. 
the chance to elect a new parliament. And if you look at, at the polls, it's more than 70% of the people in Moldova who want the SNAP parliamentary elections. And it's been all the political parties have been saying that we need to have SNAP parliamentary elections. They, they did say that before the presidential elections. They continue to say that uh, at the consultations that I had after I became uh, president. So uh, there is no question about the need to have the parliamentary elections. Of course, it's up to the people to decide who is going to represent them in the new parliament. And I will work according to the constitution with the new parliament. Uh, but the vote that we had in, uh, in last fall, as I said, was a vote against corruption and was a vote for justice sector reforms. And I would like to believe that this vote will continue with the parliamentary elections. Moldova badly needs political will, badly needs the cooperation of all state institutions um, to tackle corruption and to reform justice, because this is important for the people to believe in their state, uh, not to leave the country. This is important for the people to have economic opportunities at home. So there is this strong support from people for the reform. And I hope this strong commitment for justice sector reform from the people is going to translate into clean parliamentarians, into members of the parliament who are not afraid of independent justice and who will vote for the reforms that, that we need to be voted to do the reforms. But of course, it's up to the people. Thank you, Madam President. We now move to five questions at a time. In order, we will have uh, Mr. Corlatean, Mr. Fournier, Mr. Goncharenko, Madam Bayer, and Mr. Zygimont. We start with uh, Mr. Corlatean. Titus, you have the floor. I think you are in the room. Titus. Yes, Mr. President. Bun venit la Strasbourg, doamnă președintă. Madam President, because the issue of the management of the Transnistrian file was already raised, I will switch to a distinct uh, question related to the, uh, the issue of uh, national identity in the Republic of Moldova, which is an essential issue for the development of uh, your country. My question is the following one. Don't you think that any decision of the Constitutional Court in a rule of law state should be fully implemented? For instance, a uh, decision of the Constitutional Court that established a number of years ago that looking to the Declaration of Independence from 1991, 27 of August, uh, looking to the Constitution and to the position of uh, the Academy of the Republic of Moldova and the truth, historical truth and the cultural identity, the state official language of the Republic of Moldova is the Romanian language reflecting the national identity. Should this decision that was not implemented by the previous governments should be implemented by the parliament and the future government in the rule of law state? Thank you. Thank you. We now move to the second question by uh, Bernard Fournier. Qui est dans la chambre, je crois. Bernard, vous avez la parole. Monsieur le Président, Madame la Présidente, mes chers collègues, une lutte renforcée contre la corruption était l'un de vos engagements de campagne et vous nous l'avez rappelé à nouveau dans votre propos introductif et je vous en félicite. Comment cela se traduit-il dans le contexte actuel où vous ne disposez pas, cela vient d'être rappelé également, où vous ne disposez pas, disais-je, de majorité au Parlement. Je vous remercie. Merci Bernard. We now move to uh, Mr. Goncharenko. Alexei, you've got the floor. Uh, Your Excellency, Madam President, first of all, thanks that your first visit as the President was to Ukraine, to Kiev, and uh, my question is next. You already mentioned the massive violation of human rights in the occupied by Russian Federation Transnistria, and my question is how we can solve this problem, what can be done for this, and who in general is uh, responsible for the respect of human rights uh, there, uh, Moldova or the state occupant? Thank you. Thank you, Alexei. We now move to the question by Petra Bayer, who is in the room. Petra, you have the floor. 
Thank you very much. Eight years ago, I have been invited by UNDB to Chisinau to give workshops with parliamentarians and with civil society organizations about things like quotas, gender representation, how to handle quotas, and also gender budgeting. I would like to know which of these things you already mentioned to implement in Moldova. And I also know that in 2017, Moldova signed the Istanbul Convention. What are the further plans? When will you ready? It. Thank you very much. Thank you, Petra. We now move to uh, Mr. Sigmund Barnapal. He is remotely. Voila, you have the floor. And maybe we can uh, eliminate, not in the bad way, John Howell, who is still hanging on there. <laughs> voila, you've got the floor. Thank you, Thank you Mr. Chair. Uh, Madam President, the positive experiences of autonomous regions have been widely recognized and the Parliamentary Assembly adopted a resolution in this matter. My question is, what is your opinion about the future prospects of the Autonomous Territorial Unit of Gagauzia in light of the Unionist movement in the Republic of Moldova? Thank you very much. Thank you very much. We had our five questions. Ah, apparently the President did not hear you very well. Could you repeat, the please? Sentence. The last sentence. Varna, if you could repeat your last sentence, but I think he's already, yeah. Yes. So my, my, my question is, uh, what is your uh, opinion, uh, Madam President, about the future prospects of the Autonomous Territorial Unit of Gagauzia in light of the unionist movement in the Republic of Moldova? Thank you very much. Thank you. Madam President, you have the floor for these five questions. Yes, thank you very much. Um, the first question on the Romanian language, uh, which has been stated by the Constitutional Court in its decision, but it's still Moldovan called in the in the Constitution. And um, the question is to the uh, to the Parliament, because the Parliament is the one to adjust the article in the Constitution. And until now, there hasn't been enough parliamentarians who would want to support uh, the change in the Constitution and to have the proper name of our language in the Constitution. So as uh, soon as we will have a parliament uh, which would be ready, would be committed to change things in the Constitution, um, then uh, the problem will be, will be solved. In the meantime, of course, what we have to do and what I have started to work on is to have programs for the um, people to be able to study the Romanian language, uh, to use it. And of course, we are uh, committed to support the um, training programs uh, for uh, the uh, uh, languages of the Gagauz community, uh, of the Ukrainians and, uh, and the others. So we're trying to, to go hand in hand um, with such uh, programs. But otherwise, um, it's for the parliament to change that article in the constitution. Uh, the second question, uh, how do we fight corruption if we don't have support in the parliament? Um, as uh, I have uh, uh, said already, the Constitutional Court just issued uh, a decision a few days ago uh, which allows me to uh, dissolve the parliament, which means we are going to have snap parliamentary elections. And my hope is that this time we'll have uh, at least the majority of parliamentarians who support the anti-corruption agenda, because this is not my anti-corruption agenda. This is the anti-corruption agenda of the people of Moldova. And, and we saw this in the presidential elections. On the human rights, human rights issues in Transnistria, as I said, this is a big issue. We haven't been successful on tackling uh, this issue. We haven't been successful in identifying the, the ways uh, the leverages uh, to defend uh, the rights of the people there. So we're still to work on it. On the gender issue, um, I'll not be able to tell exactly where we are in terms of the gender budgeting, but I can tell you that uh, things are changing uh, slowly. I was the prime minister of the first government in Moldova, which included more women ministers than, than men ministers. Uh, we uh, have um, 
more women running for the uh, position of mayors. It's not easy. The hate speech is a very big issue, and it's bigger than uh, for the for the male uh, politicians. But the change is there. We have a lot of courageous women. The big uh, problem that the country is facing is, of course, violence against women. And as you said, the government has signed the Istanbul Convention, but the current parliament doesn't seem to have enough votes to ratify the convention. And apparently, we'll have to wait until the, the next parliament to have the, the convention ratified. But then it's more than about the ratification. It's about measures that have to be put in place to make uh, women's uh, lives safe. And then, of course, we have to work on the difference in on, on reducing the gap, on, on getting rid of the gap, on uh, pay gap for, for men and women. So there have been some changes. Uh, we have to, we had to fight for uh, for our rights, but there is uh, still a lot to be done. Um, and on the future of Gagauzia and the unionist movement, I have to tell you that the unionist uh, uh, movements have been there uh, since the independence of the country. So there is nothing that has changed, and there is no there are no threats and dangers to the future of the Gagauzia autonomy. And uh, what, what I've been trying to do, and uh, I've been trying to do this in the campaign period, and I'm uh, continuing this now, is to try to find uh, common objectives and to unite the society around these common objectives. And uh, at these elections, I got votes from the Russian-speaking people, maybe fewer from Gagauzia, I'm still to, to work on that, but I would like, uh, our society to to unite against the uh, uh, unite uh, around the the common objectives, and there are many of them, and I'm sure that we can do that. Thank you very much. We do have room for the next five questions. I do apologise to the other colleagues, but as you know, we're always limited in time. Nevertheless, we will take five more questions if you allow me to do so, Madam President. But I think you've got maybe a few minutes to go over time. So we have in the following order Laima Andrikiene, we've got Ahmed Yildiz, we've got Yuri Olenkov, we've got Rafael Hussainov and Pierre Alain Frides. So without the delay, remotely we now have Laima Andrikiene. Laima, you have the floor. Thank you very much, Mr. President. Uh, Madam President Sando, wonderful speech, congratulations. And um, many questions have been already asked. So in order not to repeat them, I would like to ask you, how do you describe your relations with the Russian Federation? We all are aware of the tensions around Ukraine. It's in your closest neighborhood. Do you feel safe? Or do you experience any unwanted uh, influence from Russia? Thank you. Thank you, Laima. We now have Ahmed uh, Yildiz, who is in the room. Ahmed, you have the floor. Madam President, thank you very much. As you know, Turkey values very much success of Moldova and tries to help in any way possible. When I visited your country, I came to the conclusion that Gagauzia's success is very important for the prosperity and peace of the country. I appreciated that uh, two draft laws were passed on upgrading the autonomy, but the third one is prepared, but is still not uh, legislated. It was prepared on the recommendation of the OSC High Commissioner. Uh, what do you see about the future of this third draft law? Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Ahmed. We now have our colleague Yuri Olenikov on remote base. Uh, Yuri, you have the floor. Yuri, we don't hear you. Please unmute. We do not hear you. And he's gone. Please request the floor again, Yuri. Okay, we will go to now to Rafael, Rafael Hussainov. Rafael, you have the floor. And we'll come back to Yuri afterwards. Thank you, Chair. 
Moldova has been always known as a land of peaceful coexistence for people of different ethnicities and backgrounds. Today, many communities live side by side and in mutual respect. Madam President, from your perspective, to see any major challenges and threats to such peaceful coexistence inside Moldova, and do you see any specific policies to move further on these matters? Thank you. Thank you, Rafael. I still don't see Yuri coming back, so we will go to Pierre Alain Frides. Je pense qu'il est dans la chambre. Pierre Alain, voilà, je vous vois. Pierre Alain, vous avez la parole, and please uh, contact Mr. Olenikov, Yuri, in order for him to connect again. Pierre Alain, vous avez la parole. Madame la Présidente, nous connaissons votre intention d'organiser des élections parlementaires anticipées pour réaliser le programme ambitieux que vous venez de nous rappeler pour mettre un terme à la corruption, pour une justice fiable, pour un décollage économique et social de la Moldova. Dans un contexte politique très polarisé, à la croisée des mondes, pour reprendre les paroles de Josette Durieux, vous venez d'obtenir un feu vert de la Cour constitutionnelle. Mais un autre problème se pose, la pandémie de Covid-19 et la déclaration de l'état d'urgence par la majorité parlementaire éventuellement prolongée. Madame la Présidente, dans ce contexte, comment appréciez-vous la possibilité et l'opportunité d'organiser au plus vite les élections que vous souhaitez Merci Pierre-Alain. On va voir si on peut encore avoir Yuri Olenikov en ligne. Is there someone who can help us to get our Russian colleague online? It's coming, apparently. I'm looking to my left. Oops. There we go. Yuri, you got the floor, but you need to unmute. Yes, there you go. You've got the floor. Please speak. Добрый день, госпожа президент. Прежде всего, желаю вам успехов в вашей деятельности. Но мой вопрос состоит в следующем. Во время выборов в прошлом году вы обращались к избирателям на русском языке. Его знают более 80% молдаван, а треть населения Молдовы считает себя русскоязычными. Тем не менее, вы еще в период работы в Министерстве образования добились понижения статуса русского языка. Этот курс продолжается, к сожалению, и сегодня. Согласны ли вы, что чем больше человек знает языков, тем он интеллектуально богаче и интереснее в общении? И мой вопрос в следующем. Вы считаете, последовательный отказ от русского языка – это лучший способ развития демократии в Молдове? Спасибо. Thank you very much. On the uh, relations with Russia, uh, we are interested in having good relations with all the countries, and we are interested in having good relations with Russia. Of course, we are concerned with the developments in the region, and we very much hope that peace is going to be uh, the solution. Um, we do have uh, a big agenda, as I said, with the Russian Federation. We do want to recover um, our trade uh, preferences, the trade regime, uh, which we had before signing the uh, free trade regime with the EU, and we have been working on that, and we've been talking to the um, authorities in Moscow. We do have many Moldovans working in Russia, and we are concerned, and we want to make sure that they have good uh, living and working uh, conditions. We hope to be able to sign a social security um, agreement with Russia, and there are many other things that, that we need to solve, and for that we need to have a dialogue, and we're interested in this uh, dialogue. On the uh, second issue, um, on the third law uh, that uh, was mentioned here for Gagauzia, I have to tell you that even though there has been a working group established in the parliament to develop the legislation, some political forces in the parliament uh, didn't wait until this work would be completed in the parliament, and they decided to put for vote these laws uh, before the work of the group was uh, finalized, including with a support from the international community, from those donors who were involved in this issue. And because of this, because something uh, which could have uh, got uh, general support from all the political parties 
uh, in the parliament was used politically, you know, uh, and, and the process was cut, um, the, the uh, result is, is not the best. But, uh, of course, there is willingness to talk about this. There is willingness from all the political parties. Uh, we want everyone to feel uh, secure, everyone to feel good in our country. And, and the next question was about the peaceful coexistence. And I do support this, and I've been working on this. In my society, in my country, politicians, irresponsible politicians, have been trying to divide people uh, again and again because this has helped them to uh, secure votes. But this has been going against the interests of the people. As I said, there are differences, of course, in any society. That there, are, there are differences uh, among people, but there are also common goals. And I think my uh, uh, nation, our people, are getting to the point to understand that there are more common goals than, than differences. And that will help us unite around the meaningful agenda to transform the country and to get rid of the corrupt politicians who have been dividing uh, the country. Uh, I do have respect for all the ethnic groups in my uh, country, and I will continue to work to show this respect and to promote specific measures for the people to feel respected and secure, no matter what, what language they speak. On the state of emergency, the state of emergency has been uh, imposed by the politicians who don't want to have snap parliamentary elections, but they will not be able to uh, um, to prolong this forever. It's not that we're going to stay to, to be in the state of emergency forever. And especially, um, uh, it's clear to, to the people because the measures that the government has taken after the state of emergency has been approved uh, are not different than the measures that the government has taken uh, to deal with the pandemics before the state uh, of the emergency. So there are clear signs uh, of the real uh, meaning before the decision to impose the state of emergency. Um, and we'll see what the Constitutional Court is going to say, because uh, uh, some members of the Moldovan Parliament went to the court uh, to asking for, for the court to cancel it. But uh, as I said, the, the snap elections are going to happen, and the Moldovan people will have their right to elect a new parliament uh, in a free and fair elections. Um, про русский язык вы сказали, что я, когда была министром э, образования, приняла или подготовила э, закон для того, чтобы понижать статус русского языка. Я хочу сказать, что это неправда. Э, закон, который мы продвигали, было про то, чтобы э, дети, их родители могли выбрать, какой язык им изучать в школах. И русский был один из тех языков, которые дети и их родители могли э, выбирать. Э, выбор – это не против кого, это для того, чтобы, э, чтобы э, дети, чтобы их родители делали то, что лучше для них. Э, и Опять же, все условия для того, чтобы наши дети учили русский язык, они там. Никто э, не уволил э, учителей. То есть условия есть. Э, и наоборот, я считаю, что э, чем больше языков наши дети будут знать, тем лучше для нашей страны. Thank you very much, Madam President. This concludes our Q&A, as they say. We would love to have you a lot more hours to shoot, um, or not shoot, I mean shoot questions. Don't get that wrong, right? No, I understand. <laughs> Don't get that wrong. Thank anyway, we're very pleased that you have been now the first president that allows us to reboot our activities. So you're the first president of a country, of Moldova in this case, who physically is present. I'm very proud and, and honored by that. Thank you very much. Thank you. And I hope that we will see each other in the near future. Thank you, Madam President. Thank you all, dear colleagues, for being present. This concludes this Q&A.
L'ordre du jour appelle la suite de la discussion du rapport d'activité du bureau et de la commission permanente, documents 15, 263 et addendum 1 et 2. Nous devrons en avoir terminé avec ce débat vers 17h30. C'est la raison pour laquelle je vous demande de démarrer maintenant. Je devrais interrompre la liste des orateurs vers 17h25. Je rappelle que le temps de parole des orateurs est de 3 minutes et je donne tout de suite la parole à M. Lidl Granger pour les conservateurs. We just heard from the Moldovan president about what progress can and should be made in countries which need our help probably more than anywhere else. But I would say that we ourselves actually have to make progress. Over the last few months, we have actually seen the Council of Europe slipping back, in my view. We have countries leaving the Convention. We have countries blatantly Um, looking at aggression in other countries. We have countries which have ignored, dare I say, democracy, part of it due to the pandemic, I accept, but also so many people are actually using this as an excuse. So are we in a better place? And have we made progress since we met a year ago, this time last year? The answer is I don't think we have. We must and actually need to do more. Where we have agreements, be they gentlemanly, or they in statute. We should stick to them. If we don't stick to them, you must expect a backlash, Madame Therese, because people and human nature is like that. Where you leave a vacuum, as we know, and we have seen it many times in the past, something will fill it. And I, for one, am concerned in areas, including the EU, and we've just had an interesting time with the, United, uh, with the European Union, coming and joining us in the Court of Human Rights and being part, part of PACE, Is that the right thing to do? Is that progress? And I would argue possibly not. Progress is about what you can achieve using the resources to make sure that you make it better, in our case for democracy and also for human rights. And I don't think that that is happening at the moment. Yeah, I have seen times like this, as we all have in our, over our years, I'm 62, we've seen it. But I just wonder whether we need to do better. Our president's trip to both Turkey and to Russia, I think was fine as they went, but we could have done better. Now that's not a personal sight on the president, it is a sight on all of us. We are here collectively. But I would say this, that it's all very well for anybody to go to any country. But if that country then says, well, we're going to do whatever we want anyway, then you must question it, question closely. The situation in Varni is, is, a, is, a, is a prime example. The, the, court, the rule of law in our world and in our lives should be everything. And that, I think, is where we perhaps differ. I differ with colleagues. That actually that is the most important thing, bringing us together in that sense of unity, in that sense of understanding. And Madame Therese, it doesn't matter if you're from France or the United Kingdom. The common goal must be the rule of law and order, the upholding of democracy, the understanding of people's rights, both civic and um, corporate, but also making sure that we push forward our agenda, which is to bring people in that need it. And I think the Moldovian president was right. We need to do more. Thank you, Madam Trees. Thank you very much. Merci. Je donne maintenant la parole à Monsieur Katrugalos pour la gauche unitaire européenne. I fully agree with the report that, in sum, we have done a good job this month. We adapted to dire circumstances and continued working with factionality. So we kept promoting the strategic priorities of the Council of Europe, as we are going to discuss later at this session in the framework of the report by Tini Cox. Despite the ominous uh, prognostics or even uh, the wishful thinking and hidden aspirations by some, still, We have challenges ahead to all facets of our convention-based system, including also the respect of judgments of the European Court. And we should always have in mind that the convention is intended to guarantee not rights that are theoretical, 
but rights that are practical and effective, and that there is no watertight division separating between different spheres, the rule of law, for instance, or the political rights and individual freedoms. This is clearly shown by the recent developments in Turkey. We have to react to a range of problematic situations, beginning by challenges to parliamentary democracy, such as the threat of the banning of uh, the HDP, the People's Democratic Party, but also to the undermining of women's rights by the withdrawal from the Istanbul Convention and the non-implementation of Kabbalah and the Demirtas judgments. The immediate releases, the release of the latter must be a priority for all of us. It is not just a matter of non-compliance of a state with its obligations, but a symbolic fight for both democracy and parliamentarians in our continent. Our reaction to COVID was adequate. We have discussed how democracies should face COVID-19, as many governments have seen the pandemic as an opportunity for curtailing rights and freedoms. But we have also reacted to threats by private power, discussing the freedom of expression, but also the reaction of big pharma to the pandemic. We have said loud and clear that the vaccines should be a global public good. Our voted resolution calls both to ensure vaccine equity and to check on the profiteering practice of multinational pharmaceutical companies. And we haven't forgotten social justice. COVID has been characterized as the inequality virus, as it has exacerbated inequalities. We have tried to promote tax fairness and equity by supporting OECD efforts for a new digital tax and a minimum corporate tax worldwide. We should keep working for democracy and, and uh, human rights. Many thanks, uh, Madam President. Merci, Monsieur. Nous continuons avec Monsieur Gutierrez uh, pour l'Espagne, s'il vous plaît. C'est à vous. Merci, Señora Presidenta. Buenas tardes, colegas. Eh, sean mis primeras palabras para mandar un afectuoso saludo a todas las delegaciones en nombre de la delegación española. En un momento complicado y difíciles para todos en nuestros países con motivo de la pandemia. Eh, colegas, la semana pasada se aprobó en el Parlamento español la Ley de Protección de la Infancia y de la Adolescencia. Seguramente la ley más innovadora y más avanzada en materia de protección de lo que son los menores y los jóvenes. Un colectivo especialmente vulnerable durante la pandemia, como el colectivo de las personas mayores, de las mujeres y también de las personas con discapacidad. A este último me quería referir. El Comité de Derechos Sociales de la Secretaría General ha emitido un informe sobre discapacidad, educación y empleabilidad en España, y, entre otras cosas, eh, emite y señala la preocupación por la situación de inclusión laboral de este colectivo en mi país, donde solo el 25% tiene un empleo estable. Tomamos y acogemos esas recomendaciones y observaciones con gran interés, porque para la delegación española es un tema muy importante. De hecho, mantuvimos una jornada de trabajo entre la Asamblea Parlamentaria del Consejo de Europa y el Parlamento Español con expertos y donde participó nuestro presidente Rick Times sobre esta materia. Porque las personas con discapacidad están sufriendo la marginación que se produce desde la invisibilidad y desde la falta de apoyo en la pandemia. Pero lo que vamos señalando es que vamos a salir de la crisis de la pandemia y la crisis económica y social, y ellos van a tener una posición todavía peor. Por eso creo que nuestra institución debe ocuparse y preocuparse de este colectivo. Creo que deberíamos hacer un informe sereno y profundo sobre la discapacidad, un observatorio en todos los 47 países, para señalar los abusos, pero también para ser capaz de detectar las buenas prácticas que se vienen produciendo, de forma que tengamos unas pautas comunes que nos sirvan a todos para trabajar, porque lo importante no es salir solamente de la crisis de la pandemia y la crisis económica y social, lo importante es salir sin dejar a nadie detrás, y menos a los colectivos más vulnerables, en este caso, a las personas con discapacidad. Muchas gracias. Merci. Je donne la parole à Monsieur Rubignan d'Arménie. Est-ce qu'il est là? Je ne le vois pas. Non. Donc, euh, je passe la parole à Madame Castel d'Espagne, s'il vous plaît. Madame Castel. 
Thank you, Madam Chair. Sorry. <laughs> well, I, I would like to draw your attention because I think it is important um, to, to um, uh, draw your attention about the mechanism or boosting or an endorsing uh, mechanism to solve political problems with, uh, through political dialogue. So uh, by promoting and launching uh, dialogue, but not only between countries, uh, but also inside the countries, inside the, st the member states. Uh, we are all aware that uh, the Council of Europe and the Parliamentary Assembly are the relevant or important forums and perfect forums uh, to do that uh, as the organizations in charge to promote and to, to care uh, and to protect the human rights, uh, the rule of law and the democracy. Thank you very much. Merci, Madame. Uh, Monsieur Maroukian d'Arménie, c'est à vous. Thank you, Madam Chair. I would like to uh, touch uh, an issue that just a week ago in Azerbaijan happened, which is really a disgusting event. So the public TV in Azerbaijan broadcasted an hour-long program inaugurating a new museum in Baku to celebrate the victory in the 44th day in Nagorno-Karabakh. In this show of terror, the president of Azerbaijan, Ilham Aliyev, was seen proudly walking around in a military uniform showing off the Armenian military equipment and the life-size installation of the mannequins, figures, parodying the Armenian soldiers. The centerpiece of the so-called Park of the Trophies was a long pathway made from the helmets of killed and captured Armenian soldiers. So you can see in this photo, which is a really disgusting scene. So, all of these took place not in an unknown state, but in one of the member states of the Council of Europe, Azerbaijan. Azerbaijan is the country that continues to illegally hold more than 200 Armenian prisoners of war. Please take a minute. I want to show some other photos. Uh, those are not photos from the past, it nowadays, when Azerbaijan considers normal to chain people and present human degrading treatment and torture as a regular attitude towards prisoners of war. Now you can see Azerbaijani children playing with Armenian soldiers' mannequins. So the parody that it's a disgusting show in a 21st century, in a modern state, in a member state of the of Europe. You can see chained soldier wounded, so they are showing their children. The people are in line to visit this disgusting park, which I think must be closed. So it, you saw that in one of the photos, an Azeri child is playing playfully, innocently with the racist caricature of an Armenian soldier who is currently languishing and likely being tortured in an Azerbaijani jail. The opening of such a park clearly confirms that in Azerbaijan, there is institutional hatred towards Armenian and Armenians. By this section, President Aliyev joined the list of such dictators as Hitler and as Saddam Hussein. At the meanwhile, what is going on in Azerbaijan now reminded me of Iraq in the late 1980s, when another dictator utilized 5,000 Iranian helmets of the killed soldiers extracted from the battlefield to complete the monument that had he called the Victory Ark. That man was Saddam Hussein. Like Hussein, Aliyev thinks that this is what will help him to glorify the strength of the ISIS-type army that Azerbaijan has. Like Hussein, Aliyev decided to, return, to not return the prisoners of war from Azerbaijan to Armenia. This park is clearly showing that the aggressive identity of Azerbaijani authorities and the real face they promote racial hatred, consider ill treatment and torture, normal behavior to be presented and shown to the next generations and the entire world. Dear colleagues, the history has proven if necessary steps are not taken on time to stop dictators and their aggression, it usually stops being a local issue and spreads all over the world. I do call on all of you. This park must be closed. And I wait for your condemnation and critics. Thank you so much. Merci. Je donne la parole maintenant à Monsieur Nemet de Hongrie, s'il vous plaît. C'est à vous.
Thank you, Madam. Uh, congratulations to the rapporteur, uh, Mr. Poche, uh, for the progress report. Uh, all of us in Europe, we are fighting the coronavirus, and uh, I'm very glad that our president was so insistent on uh, coming to Strasbourg and we can meet again after one and a half year. Uh, we are probably in the last phase of this fight uh, against the virus, and uh, that is uh, called the mass vaccination phase of our fight. And uh, I'm convinced that uh, all of us, uh, we are uh, trying to focus our activities on the most effective way of this mass vaccination. In Hungary, uh, we have reached around 25% of the total population with a, a broad variety of vaccines that we are employing. Uh, and uh, probably this is the most important what I would like to address at this stage, uh, that uh, there is no ideological or uh, geopolitical reason not to concentrate our efforts on saving lives. This is not an ideological question, not a political one, but this is about saving lives. And I uh, would like to uh, 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 suggest to uh, analyze uh, the experience what we are having. The other issue which I would like to uh, mention to you uh, shortly is that we are uh, preparing take from t for taking over the uh, uh, Committee of Ministers Presidency. Uh, Hungary is going to start its activity from uh, May until uh, November. We have defined our priorities uh, and uh, very shortly uh, we will try to focus on uh, national minorities, on interreligious dialogue, on youth and uh, child and family matters, on cyber questions and uh, on uh, the uh, environmental dimension of human rights, uh, which uh, is a favorite of mine, actually. You may have also been aware that uh, uh, my party, Fidesz, has uh, had to leave the European People's Party, unfortunately, and we have joined the European Conservatives, but this fact is not going to influence, I'm convinced, the successful implementation of the plan of the Hungarian presidency in the Committee of Ministers and that dimension which falls into the capacity of the Parliamentary Assembly. Thank you very much for your attention. Merci, Monsieur. Je donne la parole maintenant à Monsieur Jafarov d'Azerbaïdjan. Merci, Madame la Présidente. Even though the title of this report suggests the progress has been achieved since January, I'm not entirely sure about that. It's not because anything we have done, but because of anything we haven't done. Recently, just a few days ago, Migration Committee Chair Pierre expressed deep concern over the raising death toll from the mines the planted by Armenia in Karabakh. Since trilateral statement, land miles killed 20 Azerbaijani civilians in the liberated territories. This is another war crime by Armenia. And where this assembly failed, the politically force the government of Armenia to hand over the mind maps in time. Yes, it's true. The mines are also killing in the peacetime. After hearing disrespectful accusations by Marukyan, I see that he's having a hard time to accept the terms of the new reality created by President Aliyev. It's because of they are brainwashed. It's because he was not prepared psychologically for this. It's because they believed in their own invented fake history. After hearing the hate speech by Marukyan, too many of you may think peace is impossible. It's unreal. But that's a dangerous, defeated belief endorsed by the government of Armenia. Peace is attainable. Even though we will never forget the crimes committed against us, 
Azerbaijanis. But we have to look into the future. We are not referring to an absolute and infinite concept of the peace, but we are referring to an attainable, a practical peace. And yes, surely there could be quarrels or conflicts, such as there are between the families and neighbors. And from here, I address to Armenian origin living in Khankandi, Agdara, Khojali, where the Russian peacekeeping contingent is temporarily deployed. We consider those Armenians as our citizens. Reintegration is a matter of time. It's inevitable and it will happen. Right now, we are in the first stage of great reconstruction in Karabakh. Different formats, cooperation formats are created. Thank you. Merci, Monsieur. Dernier orateur pour le rapport d'activité, j'appelle Monsieur Mularczyk de Pologne, s'il vous plaît. Uh, Madam President, I would like to thank uh, the rapporteur for this introduction to the uh, report in the activities of the Bureau and the Standing Committee. I would like to refer only to the document 1526-free uh, at uh, election of judges to the European Court of Human Rights. The committee recommends to the Assembly to reject the Polish list of the candidates for procedural reason, even before interviewing them to which they were invite, invited and were waiting for, for it during the meeting of the committee. I would like to strongly underline that the national selection procedure fulfilled all standards described in guidelines of the Committee of Ministers dated March 2012. It is also worth noting that the advisory panel was duly consulted by the Polish Ministry of Foreign Affairs and the national selection procedure applied by the Polish authorities satisfied all the requirements of fairness and transparency defined by the Parliamentary Assembly of the Council of Europe. In, this, in a neutral, I would like to inform you that the national procedure included inter alia an invitation to submit candidates published in several nationwide newspapers, information on the website of, of, of the Minister of Foreign Affairs and letters with information from the Minister of Foreign Affairs about the selection procedure indicating the possibility of submitting candidates addressed to several hundred entities, including presidents of courts, uh, the denies of the university, law faculties, bar legal advisors and advocates and NGO dealing with the uh, protection of human rights. Thanks to the information published on the websites of the Minister of Foreign Affairs, the public uh, had the opportunity to follow the course of the national selection procedure of candidates for the post of judge to HCHR. Honorable members, I am assure you that we have uh, made every effort to carry out this selection procedure in line with the standards of the Council of Europe. I am convinced that all Polish candidates are of high moral character and possess the qualification required for an appointment to, to the post of judge. Their education and professional experience guarantee that they are that can, uh, can be considered for this position. Moreover, the list of candidates is based on the principle of balance between men and women, and most of the candidates are women. I ask you, honorable members, to allow the candidates to be interviewed and to let the committee on the election of judges to make its decision again, this time after the meeting with the candidates. I believe that such procedure will be more transparent. The higher degree of transparency and respect for candidates will ensure that the procedure is in line with the standards of the Council of Europe as an organization whose objective is in the protection of human rights. I kindly ask you to support our motion, our motion for the return of the list to the committee. Thank you, Ms. Madam President. Thank you, dear colleagues. Merci, Monsieur. Je dois maintenant interrompre la liste des oratrices et des orateurs. Les oratrices et orateurs inscrits qui, présents dans l'hémicycle ou participant à distance, n'auraient pu s'exprimer, peuvent dans les 4 heures transmettre leur intervention dactylographiée au service de la séance pour but de publication au compte rendu, à condition cependant pour les délégués participants à distance de pouvoir faire état de leur présence effective au moment de la clôture du débat. 
Cette transmission doit être effectuée par voie électronique. Monsieur le rapporteur, vous avez trois minutes pour répondre aux intervenants. C'est à vous. Thank you so much uh, to all of you, uh, all, uh, all uh, subjects raised. <clears throat> I think uh, they are very important. I would like only to go back to what uh, Petra Bayer said about uh, Istanbul Convention. Uh, there is uh, sometimes the arguments coming from some countries saying that uh, we have better protection by our national laws, so we don't need this. I strongly believe that even this is truth, we have to show the others, those who do not have such a good uh, national uh, uh, um, law that we stick to these rules and we stick to these uh, principles and <clears throat> that we are going to promote and fight for against uh, against any discrimination of women and uh, withdrawing from Istanbul uh, um, uh, convention is very very bad signal uh, so so I hope, I hope that uh, we are going to, uh, to speak more about this, and I hope that uh, those who are saying we don't need this, because anyway we have perfect law, uh, they, uh, they will not give a bad example to the others who doesn't have such a good uh, protection. Thank you very much. Je vous remercie. La discussion est close. Le bureau a décidé de proposer à la ratification de l'Assemblée des saisines des commissions contenues dans les documents 15-263 et ADDOM 1. Il n'y a pas d'objection. Dans ce cas, ces saisines sont ratifiées. Et donc là... Nous allons maintenant nous prononcer sur les autres décisions du bureau figurant dans son rapport d'activité contenu dans les documents 15, 263 et addendum 1 et 2. Y a-t-il des objections à l'adoption de ces décisions Oui, M. Mularczyk. Je n'ai pas d'objection à l'objection de la document numéro 15263 concernant la question questioning police list, election of judges to the European Court of Human Rights. I said before that I would like to strongly underline that the national selection procedure fulfilled all standards described in the guidelines of the Committee of Ministers dated March 2012. Our procedure was the same uh, like in 2012 and uh, such in many, many different countries, like Germany, Austria, or Spain. All candidates, uh, I am convinced they are high moral character and possess the qualification required for uh, in, in appointment to, to the post of judge. So uh, I kindly ask you all colleagues from all delegation to support my motion for the return of the list to the committee. Thank you very much. Donc, M. Mularczyk s'oppose à la recommandation de la Commission pour l'élection des juges de rejeter la liste des candidats au titre de la Pologne, étendant donc à demander aux autorités de Pologne de soumettre une nouvelle liste de candidats au poste de juge à la Cour européenne des droits de l'homme. Quelqu'un souhaite-t-il intervenir pour s'opposer à cette proposition M. Ulrich, président de la Commission sur l'élection des juges à la Cour européenne des droits de l'homme, peut-être Je ne sais pas où il est. Il est en ligne. Il n'y a personne. Oui, Monsieur Poitchek. Ah non, Monsieur Cox. Je... On va y arriver. C'est à vous.
Merci beaucoup, Madame la Présidente. Uh, I do not think that we should support this proposal from, uh, from coming from, from Mr. Mulacic. Our committee on the election of judges has done its work uh, in, uh, at our request, and it has taken this decision. And therefore, I think we should, uh, we should uh, not undermine the authority of that committee and uh, now uh, oppose uh, the rejection of the list of, of Poland. Uh, the Polish uh, authorities know what to do, and they have to come up with a new list uh, that meets uh, the criteria, and as I remember, that it was important that the procedures followed in Poland were not the right procedure. So I asked the Assembly not to follow the proposal of Mr. Mulacic and to accept the proposal of the Bureau. Thank you very much. Donc, nous allons devoir voter. Alors, avant d'appeler le vote, je rappelle que la proposition de M. Mulacic tend à renvoyer la liste de candidats au titre de la Pologne à la Commission pour l'élection des juges à la Cour européenne des droits de l'homme. Nous allons voter à la majorité simple. Je rappelle, pour que ce soit bien clair, ceux qui approuvent l'objection de M. Mularchi doivent voter oui. Ceux qui soutiennent la recommandation de la Commission pour l'élection des juges de rejeter la liste au titre de la Pologne doivent voter non. Je pense que j'étais assez clair. On va pouvoir commencer le vote. Le scrutin est ouvert dans l'hémicycle et à distance. Le scrutin est clos. Je demande l'affichage du résultat. L'objection est rejetée par 54 voix contre 28. Il sera donc demandé aux autorités de Pologne de soumettre une nouvelle liste de candidats. Personne ne soulève d'objections supplémentaires Où ça Ah oui. Donc, M. Brabander, il semblerait que vous ayez également une objection. Je vous écoute. Yes, uh, I want to ask the Assembly to vote about rejecting the list of candidates for the European Court of Human Rights put forward by Belgium. My reasons are the following. None of the candidates are magistrates. On top of that, one of them, Ms. Maite de Rue, is currently active in the Open Society Justice Initiative of George Soros, which has been trying to influence this decision and has lobbied with the court on other cases as well. We need to avoid conflicts of interest like this. Knowing this, we can't vote in good conscience about these candidates tomorrow. So please put this to the vote. We need to reject this list of candidates. Monsieur de Brabander, j'ai bien entendu votre demande tendant à rejeter la liste des juges présentés par les autorités belges. Néanmoins, je ne peux pas l'accepter car elle n'est pas recevable. En effet, conformément à la procédure d'élection des juges, seule la Commission sur l'élection des juges à la Cour européenne des droits de l'homme est habilitée à proposer à l'Assemblée de rejeter une liste de candidats. Votre demande étant irrecevable, elle ne sera donc pas soumise à un vote de l'Assemblée et nous poursuivons notre discussion. Oui, il y a un rappel à l'ordre. A... Je vous en prie. Thank you, Madame Chair. Indeed, on the paragraph item 4, the rapporteur described a case, a legal judicial case against a party in Turkey as a threat of banning. This is a judicial case, which the, the, foil, the file of which was, was returned to the prosecutor general by the Constitution Court with serious discrepancies. So it is a judicial process. Describing it as a threat is not proper. I raised this, my objection in the bureau, and the President Dems gave me right 
it to be uh, corrected, but it is not corrected in the text. I urge the rapporteur to correct this. Thank you. Alors, euh, Monsieur le rapporteur, vous vous êtes euh, informé ou y a-t-il quelqu'un qui s'oppose à cette objection Monsieur Poitchek Malheureusement, je suis désolé, j'ai euh, euh, vu ça euh, très très tard. Euh, euh, non, je suis contre. Je suis contre. Bon, ben, euh, j'ai bien entendu euh, la demande de M. Lillildiz et la réponse de M. Poitchek. Euh, nous allons donc continuer, je pense. Et nous, nous arrivons à l'ordre du jour suivant qui appelle la présentation et la discussion du rapport de Mme Elvira Kovacs au nom de la Commission d'égalité et de la non-discrimination sur préserver les minorités nationales en Europe, c'est donc le document 15.231. Sachant que nous devons lever la séance à 19h30, nous devrons interrompre notre, dé notre débat vers 19h20 pour entendre la réplique de la Commission et procéder au vote sur les projets de résolution et de recommandation. La rapporteure dispose de 7 minutes pour la présentation de son rapport et de 3 minutes pour répondre aux orateurs à la fin de la discussion générale. La parole est à Madame Elvira Kovacs. C'est à vous. Distinguished Chair, dear colleagues, 23 years after the Framework Convention for the Protection of National Minorities entered into force, give us the opportunity to go back to fundamentals, to human dignity, inclusion, respect and recognition of minority rights in a changing environment and to examine how understanding of equality and non-discrimination may interact with the overall minority discourse. Minorities enrich the societies of each and every country in the world by working towards guaranteeing minority rights. Our main aims must be that no one is afraid of expressing self-identity as a member of a minority, fearing disadvantage might come out of such a decision. That existence and identity of persons belonging to minorities will be guaranteed and that they will benefit from the principles of effective participation and non-discrimination. It is time to reaffirm that respect for linguistic, ethnic and cultural diversity is a cornerstone of the human rights protection system in Europe and that the core value of the Framework Convention is based on the shared understanding um, that preserving stability, democratic security and peace in Europe requires protection of national minorities. However, a number of challenges are unfortunately currently reducing the capacity to protect minority rights through the tools developed over the last three decades. In particular, the stability of both states and European institutions has been shaken in recent years by intra- and interstate tensions uh, and at times by conflicts. Migration flows have also had a profound impact, both directly and indirectly, on persons belonging to national minorities and on the implementation of minority rights as set out in the Framework Convention. In addition, the COVID-19 pandemic has thrown into sharp relief the vulnerability of persons belonging to national minorities as they have frequently faced discrimination, hate speech, stigma, lack of information in minority languages, and unequal access to education following the suspension of classes in schools, preschools, uh, education during lockdowns. The report uh, in front of us, Preserving National Minorities in Europe, examines major challenges to minority rights that have emerged in recent years. Formal bringing domestic legislation into line with the Framework Convention is not sufficient to ensure an effective implementation of minority rights. There is a clear trend towards the re-securization of minority issues. Minority groups 
as the most vulnerable ones are the most targeted by hate speech, hate crime, attacks based on their ethnic origin, denial of citizenship and restriction of access to education in minority language. Insufficient media production in minority languages can prompt persons belonging to national minorities to seek alternative information sources resulting in a divided media landscape. A lack of effective, permanent and sufficiently representative consultation mechanisms in place in which minorities can participate substantially and in which they have confidence. In the course of my work uh, on this report, I have had the opportunity to examine in depth three specific situations, Latvia, Ukraine and Wales, of particular current interest in this field. The main focus of all of these situations were language rights, an area closely linked to minority identities and equality, an area that has caused an increase in tensions in a number of states in recent years. Efforts to promote the state language, which mostly pursue the legitimate aim of promoting integration and societal cohesion, may at times overstep the bounds of proportionality. Proficiency requirements in the state language in order to have access to certain professions or to the civil service decrease in the provision of teaching in and of minority languages and restrictions of the right to sit school uh, exams in these languages have all given rise to concerns over recent years. Uh, the report, Preserving National Minorities in Europe, has been prepared with the aim to present the legal and institutional framework for respecting and protecting minorities and consequently notice the main difficulties experienced in the implementation of the Framework Convention and how, the, how we, how the Assembly, can contribute to addressing these challenges. Ensure a more consistent implementation of the legal and institutional framework for respecting and protecting human rights of persons belonging to minor minorities, which is essential to peace and stability in Europe and preserve the linguistic, ethnic and cultural diversity of the continent. Identify the main trends at the European level in order to shed more light on the different national situations. Highlight existing good practices that could be applied in other countries and their compliance with the principle of non-discrimination, especially with regard to the overbridging a gap between the legal state and the rule of law and between what is legal and what is just. Secure the Convention's potential to serve as a living instrument uh, if we know that it requires both institutional commitment from the Council of Europe, but also a political will from the Member State. So, 23 years period after the Framework Convention for the Protection of National Minorities entered into force, give us the opportunity to look back and use the experience to plan and strategize for the future by discussing its implementation. Dear colleague, I am extremely sorry that I cannot be physically there present in Strasbourg with uh, all of you, but I am looking forward for a fruitful uh, debate. Thank you for your attention. Merci, Madame la rapporteure. J'ouvre maintenant euh, la discussion générale et nous commençons avec les orateurs des, au nom des groupes politiques. Nous commençons avec Madame Yasko pour, pour le PPE. Good afternoon to everyone. Uh, I would like to start with complimenting the report and saying that it's so, so good that we have this discussion. However, in the same time, I can say that I'm very sad that in the 21st century in Europe, we still have this uh, conversation whether uh, ethnic minorities are protected enough. Unfortunately, the reality that we have in Europe shows that there are many, many challenges that different ethnic minorities currently suffer, starting from the access to the health, uh, COVID vaccine, vaccination, ending with very severe violence, uh, aggression and intolerance. Something that um, 
makes me very happy when I see this report is that there are many language issues and challenges that are reported in, in, the, in this report. However, other challenges such as the hate speech um, and the spread of the fake news about the ethnic minorities is not, uh, is not is not mentioned uh, and analyzed enough. And unfortunately, what we see that some member states uh, can really become a parasite and use um, the justification to protect the national minorities as ju justification to intervene into other state affairs, which is very alarming, which happened in Ukraine, which happens in different states. And I believe that when we talk about the ethnic minorities protection, we should always separate the political part and the real uh, human rights situation but we shouldn't lie about what some member states are doing just to justify the aggression other thing that i want to mention that i wish it was more mentioned in the report is the protection of the roma uh, minority rights uh, as we know the covid uh, and the situation that happened in europe really undermined the human rights situation within the roma community communities and the access to the health, education and to the jobs. Uh, many Roma people lost their jobs and this is very, very alarming. To conclude, I would like to stress that I believe that we all, uh, there is only one solution that we all can do together is to promote more and more education about the tolerance, about the inclusion, about the respect towards each other. And I really want that one day we won't have this discussion that something is not being done well enough and that we will have that Europe that we are dreaming about and that it will have peace and respect towards each other. Thank you. Merci, Madame. Je donne maintenant la parole à Madame Ovchinikova pour Alde. Thank you, Madam Chair. Dear colleagues, first of all, I want to thank the rapporteur for her work regarding these important issues. Uh, preserving national minorities in Europe, multilingualism, multiculturalism, unique in diversity align the core values of Council of Europe, which are democracy, human rights, and rule of law. These fundamentals must be ensured for all societies, for all citizens, major or mini nationals. The Alliance of Liberals and Democrats for Europe is strongly committed to ensuring, enhancing, and defending our common core values, including uh, equality, non discrimination, social justice, inclusive and open debate. National minorities are equal citizens who deserve to be treated uh, with respect and sensitivity, and their contributions to the cultural diversity should be appreciated. So we welcome the draft of resolution and recommendation as the intent to reform Council of Europe members to the framework conventions for the protection of national minorities and encourage those states which haven't ratified to do it. So, Respecting and protecting national minorities is associated with preserving stability, democratic security and peace in Europe, as well as related to the climate of tolerance dialogue. Legislative and policy measures are very important, therefore, in particular, to ensure that persons belonging to national minorities can exercise participated meaningfully in cultural, social and economic life and in public efforts in the country where they live. It was the researchers in migration studies called acculturation or integration. Dear ladies and gentlemen, is the issue of national minorities have been discussed and will be discussed numerous times in this assembly. But what is crucial today is not to let this topic be manipulated with the become an instrument of hybrid conflicts. I want to add that in resolution in report don't take into account that language can be used as an instrument in hybrid politics, which goes beyond national minority policies or intention of cultural preservation. And after all, the Alliance of Liberal and Democrats for Europe condemned stigmatization, discrimination and violence against national minorities 
and call to combat hate speech in media, in political speeches. We call to strengthen multilateral dialogue and to more multifaceted cooperation with civil society and acknowledge to the value of minorities in the intellectual development of Europe. So thank you for attention. Merci, Madame. La parole est à Monsieur Nemet pour les conservateurs. Congratulate uh, Elvira Kovac, who had a, a, a very uh, unique and important job. Uh, congratulations to her and. Uh, I would like to uh, uh, wish her uh, a successful continuation of her activity. I would also draw your attention that uh, there is a very long tradition inside the Council of Europe uh, in uh, uh, the field of protection of national minorities, going back to the early, eight, uh, early 90s when the 1201 recommendation was adopted or in the early 2000s when the report of Andreas Gross on uh, uh, minority autonomy, autonomies was, was adapt, adopted, and also the uh, so-called Kalmar report in 2014 uh, and the Hoffman report in 2018. This report uh, fits into this long tradition. I find it very important that we are talking about national minorities and the preservation of national minorities, a very good title for uh, the report. The national minorities are a very particular group to be protected, and they cannot be mingled with other type of uh, minorities. All of them require a special uh, approach. Uh, sexual minorities, migrant communities, uh, but to realize that there is the autochthonous, traditional national minority, which is the basic value of Europe. Just inside the European Union, it, their number is over 50 million. And if we add uh, the whole of Europe, it is even uh, uh, higher uh, to uh, this number. We have to realize that this is a very particular field of, uh, of human rights uh, protection. And the Council of Europe, yes, uh, it has played uh, uh, an important role with two uh, conventions, the Language Charter and the Framework Convention. And we need to continue uh, uh, deepening our uh, uh, system. And I would like to congratulate the initiative of the rapporteur that a new online platform uh, being uh, established in order to follow the different uh, minority-related uh, human rights abuses and problems. I think it is a very good idea, and I'm curious to see in what kind of institutional character it can be uh, uh, created. So welcome, uh, uh, Mrs. Uh, Rapporteur, in this regard, and hope that the Council of Europe is going to be able to implement this good idea. The Hungarian presidency will do its utmost to continue the efforts into this direction. Thank you very much for your attention. Merci, Monsieur. La parole est à Monsieur Gomez Reno pour euh, la gauche unitaire européenne. Bon, bonsoir. Merci, Madame la Présidente. Eh, bueno, en primer lugar, creo que lo que toca es agradecer a, a bueno, la diputada ponente el trabajo que ha hecho, un trabajo de síntesis, creo que importante y que nosotros agradecemos positivamente. Más allá de eso, y sea como fuere, creo que es evidente que la situación de las minorías nacionales ahora mismo en Europa eh, pasa por un momento difícil y controvertido con muchos desafíos que tenemos que abordar de forma inmediata. De una parte, creo que todos somos conscientes de que hay un montón de, digamos, de mecanismos del ámbito legislativo de gobernanza que no acaban de ser bien, eh, digamos, que aterrizados por los diferentes Estados miembros. Y además de eso, en lo que tiene que ver con la gestión estatal de las minorías, vemos como algunos Estados tienden a una recentralización de sus, eh, digamos, capacidades administrativas que dificultan 
el día a día de todas estas minorías nacionales. Y por otra parte, en eso sí que creo que hay que ser clarísimos y contundentes y, y decirlo de forma clara. El surgimiento de expresiones políticas de extrema derecha y autoritaria es el mayor enemigo de la democracia, de los derechos humanos, pero también de las minorías, de las minorías nacionales y de las minorías étnicas que tenemos en los diferentes países de Europa. Y lo digo con claridad, porque sí es cierto que algunas expresiones de extrema derecha eh, pues se reclaman, digamos, eh, de esas identidades eh, nacionales, pero creo que hay que decirlo con claridad. Cualquier eh, identidad nacional que defienda eh, la minoría a una minoría en detrimento de los derechos de otra minoría no está trabajando positivamente a favor de la democracia. Y finalmente se hace necesario también, digamos que recordar que debemos de, de ampliar el foco y no caer en un eurocentrismo al mirar, digamos, a las minorías nacionales. Creo que, bueno, hay un montón de ciudadanos que ya son ciudadanos europeos, que han venido eh, bien migrando, bien eh, como refugiados de diferentes países, de Asia, de África, de América del Sur, y a los cuales también les debemos, debemos de tratar para que se reconozcan, eh, digamos, que sus derechos como minorías nacionales también en el ámbito de nuestros países y de, y de, y de Europa. En definitiva, eh, reconocer eh, que los migrantes y refugiados tienen que tener también estos derechos. Finalmente, para acabar, eh, particularmente yo vengo de, de Galicia, en el noroeste de, de España, en el Estado español, que también es una minoría a, nacional, y a este respecto sí que quiero bueno, poner de relieve nuestra preocupación, la mía particularmente, pero la de una parte importante de la sociedad gallega, al respecto de cómo el gobierno autonómico en particular no acaba de respetar como debiera eh, pues las cartas, los tratados, a nivel lingüístico y a otros niveles. En todo caso, ya digo, creo que es un desafío enorme el que tenemos el, el respeto a las minorías nacionales y tenemos mucho trabajo por delante gracias a la, a la ponente por su, por su trabajo de síntesis. Gracias, monsieur. Y le doy encore la palabra a monsieur Silevich para clore eh, los orateurs de grupos políticos y para el Partido Socialista. Para el Grupo Socialista, perdón. President, uh, I congratulate the uh, rapporteur, Mrs. Kovac, for this very important report. Back in the 90s, it, the Council of Europe and our Assembly in particular played a key role in establishing modern framework of minority protection. Indeed, it was our resolution which triggered adoption of the first ever legally binding instrument on minority rights, the Framework Convention. For years, the Council of Europe played a leading role both in standard setting and monitoring and promotion of proper implementation of these standards. Most importantly, the Framework Convention declared that minority rights are not a security issue, but an integral part of fundamental human rights. Regrettably, in recent years, we witnessed major backsliding in minority protection. Let's uh, call spade a spade. This is visible in many areas, and notably in the most crucial one, education. The use of minority languages in public and even private schools is curtailed in different degrees of severity in a number of member states, including, unfortunately, my country, Latvia. A number of relevant complaints have been submitted in particular to the European Court of Human Rights, and some of them have already been communicated to respective governments. Maybe even more alarming trend is that some member states refer to the protection of minority rights to justify their aggressive behavior. Such a misuse of minority rights is even more detrimental than nationalists' neglect of them as it may discredit the very idea, as it already happened in recent European history. The report by Mrs. Kovac and the resolution we are going to adopt today is a step to reverse these deplorable trends. The Assembly should remind that respect of minority rights is the only effective way how to ensure both the right to equality and the right to the preservation of identity how to achieve genuine social cohesion, not by assimilation of minorities. Restrictions of minority rights as a response to wrongdoings by their kin states may only further aggravate security. 
Cultural diversity is one of the fundamental values of modern Europe. Peace and stability are all impossible without due respect to minority rights. On behalf of the Socialist Group, I fully support the report by Mrs. Kovac and call upon all colleagues to vote for the resolution. Thank you, Madam President. Merci, Monsieur. Nous continuons la liste des orateurs dans la discussion générale. J'appelle Monsieur Voloshin pour l'Ukraine. Thank you. Uh, first, I would surely like to join those who congratulate uh, Lyra Kovac on a really brilliant work and this really uh, deep and comprehensive and unbiased report. Um, uh, I'm happy to see that in this report, uh, the situation, the challenges to national minority rights in my own country, Ukraine, is duly reflected. And it's no wonder, I believe, uh, that uh, uh, Madame Kovac met a uh, study visit uh, to Ukraine, and possibly those were the um, uh, findings of those visit that allowed her to be one of the first, uh, if not the first, in this uh, Honorable Assembly who supported my call uh, for current affairs debate on challenges to national minorities in Ukraine as a specific uh, issue. Um, I um, uh, fully agree that uh, uh, there is always a need to be found a balance between a legitimate right to promote the state language and even not less or even more legitimate obligation of every nation state to protect the weak, so to protect the minorities. In 2017 in Kiev, there was held a Eurovision Song Contest under the slogan Celebrate Diversity. Brilliant, very modern and very acute slogan, but unfortunately the one that has very little to do with green reality on the ground. Because it's not the diversity that already for eight years, one after another, governments in our country try to celebrate, but unification and assimilation. They uh, try to build a form of society where in public domain everyone speaks one language and professes one ideology, namely a nationalist ideology. Uh, from our opponents, we often hear that no one in Ukraine prohibits anyone from speaking Hungarian or Romanian uh, in Russian in private. But the very notion is, a, is discrimination in itself. Can you imagine that you would support a policy of any government that would say that it's okay if in private someone is Muslim, a woman, an LGBT, a Jew, etc., etc. Exactly, the protection of national minorities is about present as opportunities for, for them to speak their language and freely use their language in public domain. I can give you just one small example. Uh, in this honorable plenary room, uh, we all see that Russian is a working language. However, it doesn't preclude the assembly from being very often critical of these or those policies of Russia. So I can enjoy the right to speak на моем родном русском языке в этой assembly. However, I am deprived of this right in my parliament in Kiev, where every second in the street speaks Russian. Every time I try to speak Russian in parliament, the speaker switches off the microphone under the pressure of nationalist groups. The language of my vote is the language that almost everyone in Ukraine knows, or at least every second believes to be a native one. So why Russian is a key in Strasbourg and not a key in Kyiv? Uh, so, uh, and uh, I would like also to stress that uh, definitely um, there is already a poor tradition of Ukrainian governments to ignore the conclusions of Venice Commission and uh, recommendations enshrined in the resolutions consequently adopted in this Honorable Assembly to, in defense of national minority languages and national minor other national minority lies in, rights in my country. That needs to be stopped. I think that we should be a showcase for as a country where national minorities enjoy all rights. Thank you. Merci. Je passe la parole à Monsieur Badia de Roumanie. Grazie Presidente, eh, prima di tutto mi voglio congratulare con eh, l'eccellente relazione fatta dalla nostra collega e soprattutto con tutta la sua attività nel beneficio dell'Assemblea eh, parlamentare finora. Eh, desidero prima sottolineare il ruolo della Convenzione Quadro per la tutela delle minoranze nazionali che è uno strumento nato da ideali di pace e libertà delle nazioni europee, estremamente importante per l'unità del continente europeo, per la creazione di una società democratica ed inclusiva. Sono stati fatti progressi irreversibili per vivere assieme in un luogo sicuro, libero e democratico. 
L'avvicinamento degli Stati europei attorno ai valori promossi dal Consiglio d'Europa, dalla parte dell'Assemblea parlamentare, ha fatto possibile l'apparizione dei meccanismi concreti che hanno permesso alle persone appartenenti alle minoranze nazionali di usufruire del diritto alla libera associazione, alla libertà del pensiero, di esprimersi, della coscienza e della religione, di essere protetti dalle ostilità e dalla violenza, di poter prendere parte alla vita economica, sociale e culturale del loro Paese. I metodi di adesione al Consiglio d'Europa e alla Unione Europea hanno aiutato gli Stati che hanno desiderato prendere lo statuto del me di membro di compiere gli standard in ciò che riguarda i diritti delle minoranze. Una volta superato, superati gli ostacoli e visti i benefici reciproci di una società democratica inclusiva, viene naturale anche continuare a rafforzare questo percorso. Abbiamo bisogno in seguito di rispondere alle provocazioni attuali e che possa assicurare la protezione della legge rivolta ugualmente verso tutti i cittadini, altrettanto uguaglianza davanti alla legge. D'altronde sono convinto che gli esempi di buona convenienza e di buone pratiche sono molto importanti e la Romania può essere considerata un esempio da seguire per quanto riguarda il problema dei diritti delle minoranze. L'Unione Democratica, per esempio, dei Magiari della Romania è un partecipe costante sia alle decisioni governative quando fa parte della coalizione governativa, così come succede anche adesso, sia ai dibattiti parlamentari come gruppo parlamentare dell'opposizione. A livello delle amministrazioni regionali e locali, la minoranza maggiara è rappresentata molto bene e controlla circa il 70% delle decisioni dei consigli provinciali e locali in cui i cittadini maggiari sono in maggioranza. Tuttavia la Convenzione Quadro per la protezione delle minoranze nazionali contiene il riconoscimento del diritto di essi all'istruzione nella lingua madre e l'accesso alle istruzioni a tutti i livelli. In seguito desidero sottolineare due risoluzioni molto recenti. Prima è la risoluzione del Comitato dei Ministri del 2021 riguardante la messa in atto della Convenzione Quadro per la protezione delle minoranze nazionali che fa riferimento alla Bulgaria dal 13 gennaio 2021, tramite la quale le autorità bulgare sono chiamate a promuovere l'istruzione della lingua materna con la cooperazione dei gruppi delle minoranze tramite l'introduzione di questa a livello elementare e secondario, misura che dovrebbe godere anche tutti gli enici di questo Paese. E la seconda risoluzione dei Consigli dei Ministri riguarda la messa in atto della Convenzione Quadro per la protezione delle minoranze nazionali riguardante l'Ungheria del febbraio 2021, che sottolinea la necessità di sviluppare un piano esteso per revitalizzare e promuovere l'uso delle lingue e delle minoranze nello spazio ungherese. Grazie. Merci, monsieur. J'aimerais quand même qu'on essaie de limiter le temps et d'avoir le, voilà, de pouvoir parler dans le temps imparti parce que vous êtes quand même quelques-uns à vouloir prendre la parole et ce serait dommage pour ceux qui suivent de ne pas pouvoir participer à cette séance parce qu'on n'est pas assez rigoureux. Je passe maintenant la parole à monsieur Slutsky de la Fédération de Russie. Nous n'avons pas M. Slutsky, donc on continue. Euh, je passe la parole à Mme Kravchuk euh, d'Ukraine, s'il vous plaît. Oui, yes, merci. Um, first of all, uh, dear colleagues, uh, dear Ms. Kovac, first of all, I would like to congratulate the rapporteur on her um, draft resolution and the draft recommendation uh, centered on the Framework Convention for the Protection of National Minorities, which Ukraine fully uh, accessed in 1998. Without a doubt, the Convention is the instrument of the international law to bring the implementation of its standards closer to people. I have to underline that the Ukrainian authorities are very much aware of the diverse issues and concerns related to minorities. Because of that, the State Service for Ethnic Policy and Freedom of Consciousness was established earlier last year. Also, I would like to underline that we are preparing a new legislation on the national minorities in Ukraine. We hope to adopt the law at least in first reading uh, this year and it will be widely discussed with representatives of national minorities in Ukraine. 
The recently sharpened seven-year ongoing armed conflict in eastern Ukraine and illegal occupation of Crimea by Russian Federation altogether completely shifted Ukraine's landscape since 2014. Also, in the understanding of the minority issues, there are 48,000 of displaced people from Crimea. And now we have more than 100 Ukrainian citizens who are political prisoners detained by the occupying authorities, and most of them are Crimean Tatars. In practice, the level of education in Crimean Tatar language in occupied Crimea is decreasing, and schools in Crimea in practice are left without the Ukrainian language of education. By the word, the Crimean Tatars are indigenous people of the Crimea. Thank you, Ms. Kovac. I will support the resolution. Merci, Madame. Je crois que Monsieur Slutsky a pu se connecter, donc on va refaire un essai pour Monsieur Slutsky de la Fédération de Russie. Добрый день. Merci, Madame la Présidente. C'est peut-être quelques problèmes techniques. Euh, je vais parler en russe. Я приветствую всех из Москвы, из Государственной Думы и благодарю нашего докладчика, госпожу Эльвиру Ковач, за очень хороший и обстоятельный доклад. Я э, э, хотел бы поддержать выступление господина Целевича и э, господина Волошина. Действительно, э, в Латвии нарушается рамочная конвенция национальных языков и языков меньшинств Совета Европы. Э, там нельзя называть э, населенные пункты на, э, например, русском языке. Там действует дискриминационный э, закон об образовании, на основе которого нужно изучать 60% предметов в школе на латышском языке, в то время как во многих районах, как, например, Даугавпилс или Венспилс, почти 100% населения русскоязычное, и таким образом грубо нарушаются языка, права русскоязычного меньшинства. Я также поддерживаю и господина Волошина. Он сделал очень смелое выступление. Браво, Олег! Молодцом. И э, я хотел бы, поддерживая выступление господина Волошина, остановиться на законе Украины о обеспечении функционирования украинского языка как государственного, который принят был э, ровно два года назад, 25 апреля 2019 года, и э, принят э, также немного ранее Верховной Радой закон об образовании. Каждая страна защищает свой государственный язык законодательным актом. Например, в России, в моей стране имеется такой закон, но в нем четко указано, что его составной частью является и закон о языках народов Российской Федерации. Законы Украины действительно, как отметил господин Волошин, направлены на последовательное устранение языков национальных меньшинств. В соответствии с ними с 1 сентября нынешнего года прекращается образование на русском языке. А с 2023 года это будет касаться и всех других языков, являющихся в том числе и официальными в Европейском Союзе. При этом по переписи, недавней переписи населения русские составляют самую большую этническую группу в стране, 17 с лишним процентов. Почти 60 процентов населения называют русский язык родным. В 2019 году Венецианская комиссия приняла заключение по закону об обеспечении функционирования украинского языка как государственного. В заключении Венецианской комиссии отмечается, что этот законодательный акт противоречит целому ряду международных договоров, участником которых является Украина. И Венецианская комиссия также отметила противоречие данного закона Конституции Украины, статья 10.3, которой налагает обязательство гарантировать, цитирую, Свободное развитие, использование и защиту русского и других языков национальных меньшинств. Венецианская комиссия, равно как и по закону об образовании, отметила дискриминационный подход к русскому языку по сравнению с другими языками. А Венецианская комиссия не увидела причину такого дискриминационного подхода. Хочу поблагодарить нашу докладчицу, госпожу Ковач, и призвать всех заниматься как можно более серьезно этой проблемой. У нас в истории Европы уже была ситуация, когда искореняли еврейское население, и это привело к Второй мировой войне. Вы помните, сколько миллионов человек погибло? Мы должны сейчас корня пресекать нарушение рамочной конвенции национальных языков и языков меньшинств Европы и э, следовать рекомендациям частности Латвии и на Украине. Je donne la parole désormais à M. Sigvon de Hongrie, en ligne également. 
Thank you, Madam Chair, dear colleagues. The Hungarian delegation is always sensitive to any report dealing with the issue of the national minorities, since our nation has been living as a minority in seven countries during the last 100 years. We welcome the report of Ms. Elvira Kovács, since the topic of national minorities in Europe is one of the key issues which should be kept on the agenda. I would like to congratulate to Elvira to an excellent and important report. As a result of frequent border changes in European history, many national communities became minorities who are autochthonous on the territory where they have been present for centuries. Lessons from the history of the last century shows that national minority rights, rights are essential to ensure peace and stability on the continent. We fully support the rapporteur's view in the sense that the rights of national minorities constitute an integral part of human rights and are necessary to preserve political stability and to promote the diversity of cultures in Europe. Hungary greatly appreciates the role of the Free World Convention and the importance of the overall multilateral structure in harmonizing national legislation on minorities with international norms and standards and its activity in periodical supervision. However, we also attach particular importance to the regular bilateral dialogue as we feel responsible for the situation of minorities in the neighboring countries. We are convinced that the multilateral and bilateral mechanism reinforce each other. As regards the general principle of national minority protection, we consider it important to preserve both the individual and collective identity of national minorities to prevent their assimilation. The Council of Europe is the most important European institution dealing with the protection of national minorities since the European Commission has recently decided to reject the Minority Safe Pack initiative. With the decision of the Commission, uh, ignore the wish of 1.2 million European citizens. The Commission has now let down the approximately 50 million citizens of the Union who belong to national and linguistic minorities. Millions of them live in a situation of inequality in, them, in their own country already, though the European Commission, which is supposed to be the guardian of democracy, the rule of law, dignity and justice, is also turning its back on that. European institutions currently show more openness for the new challenges like illegal migration, and they seem to have forgotten the old ones, even if these problems are not solved yet. And un unfortunately, we do see cases when national minorities are suffering discrimination. Here I would like to mention that the violent attacks and intimidation against national minorities are increasing in Ukraine. Minorities are not allowed to use their, lang their language in schools and in public spaces. Dear colleagues, the rights of national minorities require further attention and the comprehensive European legal framework. Therefore, I support this report. Thank you for your attention. Merci, Monsieur. Je donne la parole désormais à Monsieur Avetizian d'Arménie. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. And I also want to thank the rapporteur Kovac for her excellent work because this is a topic that is very important in the Council of Europe, uh, regardless that we have been discussing this since 1968 when the Framework Convention was accepted. On this matter, um, I want to take the opportunity and draw everybody's attention to what is happening or what has been happening in Azerbaijan. And I want this dialogue to be in a constructive sense. What we have witnessed when Mr. Marukian was demonstrating the photos is not just a museum. It's not just the momentary lapse of thinking that Hannah Arendt has defined in her work of the birth of evil. It's something that we have seen before, that we have seen everywhere in this continent as well, but we were not able to overcome. Why I want to underline this? Because I think that our bodies, especially the ECRI, the European Commission against racism and intolerance should be carefully monitoring the situation development. Because it's not the first time, it's not just a momentary thing. It's something that has been registered in ECRI's report in 2016. It has been registered by the um, group of researchers what is happening in Azerbaijan. I want to retaliate to what my Azerbaijani colleague said. When your president is calling Armenians dogs, infidels, when there is a hatred basically industrialized by the state, it's hard to achieve the peace. We really want to have the peace, we want to be constructive, but in this kind of an environment, when you have children taken to the trophy museum, it's hard to imagine. I want every parliamentarian to go back to their home, talk to their diplomats and say, is that normal? Is it normal to keep hostages in an ISIS-style 
manner? I don't think so. I think that work of the ECRI should be strengthened. It should be reporting not only case by case when it has its timetable, but it should be reporting on specific cases when there is a flagrant violation of human rights. Uh, on the topic of the mines that our Azerbaijani colleague has presented, Armenians have having a demining project with the OSCE, and the OSCE office was closed down in Yerevan by the effort of Azerbaijan. There was a demining project in Artsakh, which was again undermined by our Azerbaijani colleagues. Azerbaijan has never requested those maps, and this is just a gimmick to withdraw our attention from the real issue of the prisoners of war in Azerbaijan. Lastly, as the people who have survived a genocide 106 years ago, we value the peace. We value it with all our heart. At the same time, without dignity, human empathy, and justice, the peace is hard to achieve. And when a child is taken to the trophy museum to see a mannequin of a deceased soldier, that is not going to help those generations to find peace. Thank you very much, Ms. Kovas, for your work. I think this direction should be strengthened. I think ECRI should be strengthened. I think also the monitoring of the National Minorities Committee should be strengthened. Thank you very much. Merci, Monsieur. Je donne la parole à Madame Yuash de Hongrie, qui est en ligne. Thank you, Madam Chair. I would like to congratulate to Elvira for this excellent report. The Council of Europe framed the Convention for the Protection of National Minorities, along with the European Charter for Regional or Minority Languages, are cornerstones in architecture of preserving national and autochthonous minorities in Europe. These legally binding international legal instruments are among the greatest achievements of our pan-European organization of 47 member countries. More regrettable is, however, that on the other hand, the European Union has not dedicated much attention and efforts to this preserving topic. One of the clear evidence of its deplorable negligence is the recent rejection of the European Citizens Initiative called Minority Safe Pack, which called on the EU to adopt a set of legal acts to improve the protection of persons belonging to national and linguistic minorities and strengthen cultural and linguistic diversity in Europe. And in the European Union, although in 1994, the EU set forth the Copenhagen criteria, a wealth of diverse requirements and prerequisites for candidate countries in the accession process to the EU, including also standards and norms on the protection of national minorities yet so far, no mechanism has been constituted to put this issue on the EU policy agenda. In addition, the European Commission even seems to impede incentives organizing from its citizens, thus enhancing distrust in EU institutions, as well as deepening the confidence crisis in the EU as whole. Well. The present report touches upon a highly topical and relevant issue. Safeguarding national minority rights is a meaningful and effective way, should not be interpreted and portrayed as a threat to national minority, and countries should posture to create a level playing field in terms of national minority rights as well as contributing to Europe unity in diversity. For this very reason, it is of paramount importance to give fresh impetus to convergence of the EU to the Council of Europe, particularly with regard to the accession of the letter to the European Convention on Human Rights. Such a major step for work could equip the EU, which means which are imperative to live up to its responsibilities and commitments and trend in the Charter of Fundamental Rights principally in the Article 21 on non-discrimination and 22 on cultural, religious and linguistic diversity. This is one of the crucial points where the priorities of the current German and the incoming Hungarian chairmanships could enhance their fruitful cooperation and where we all could benefit from synergies of the two organizations. Thank you very much indeed. Merci. Euh, la parole est désormais à Monsieur Rampi d'Italie. Il n'est pas là, Monsieur Rampi Oui, je parle trop vite. 
Oh, mi scusi lei, avevo una confusione con i microfoni. Sì, io credo che questa relazione sia molto importante. Qualche anno fa in Italia ho avuto la fortuna e l'occasione di partecipare alle celebrazioni di una giornata particolare, che è quella della lingua madre, che nasce in un momento particolare della storia, che è quello legato a una, uno dei, forse l'unico grandissimo, eh, assassinio di persone per la difesa della propria lingua, accadde in Bangladesh. Questi giovani studenti, questi giovani ragazzi difendevano la possibilità di parlare la loro lingua e per questo morirono e lasciarono la loro vita. Ecco, la riflessione sulla lingua madre è una riflessione che ci attraversa. Io in questo momento sto parlando in italiano. All'inizio della mia partecipazione in questa assemblea non lo facevo, mi sembrava giusto provare ad utilizzare una lingua internazionale perché tutti mi capissero immediatamente. Eh, poi però ho ragionato che le sfumature con cui noi tentiamo di rappresentare le nostre idee, le parole sono così importanti, non possono essere tradotte da noi, devono essere tradotte da chi lo fa per professione, con competenza, con cultura, come sono le persone che in questo momento stanno provando a rendere quello che io vi voglio dire. Ecco, allora, nel lavoro di tutela delle minoranze e nell'importanza, nel, nei racconti che abbiamo sentito, anche negli interventi di, di questi pochi minuti, io credo che sia davvero importante che il Consiglio d'Europa ritorni sul tema delle lingue, ritorni sul tema del diritto di ognuno di riconoscere le, la propria identità, che è un'identità che varia, che si trasforma, le nostre identità si mischiano hanno una vita, come anche le lingue, e quindi io sono contro i confini definiti, sono per un mondo che, che sia sempre più aperto, forse questo risolverebbe molti conflitti. Ma intanto dobbiamo garantire a tutte le minoranze, dentro di ogni Paese, di poter esprimere fino in, pro, in fondo il proprio credo, la propria religiosità, la propria cultura e la propria lingua. Anche perché, e concludo, eh, la democrazia è proprio questo, la democrazia è quel luogo dove la minoranza può vivere, può continuare ad esistere, perché la maggioranza non ha più ragione della minoranza. Si tratta solo di trovarsi occasionalmente, casualmente, in un numero maggiore di persone, ma non ha nessun motivo in più per essere più importante degli altri. Merci, monsieur. La parole est désormais à monsieur Fournier, de France. Madame la Présidente, mes chers collègues, en 1995, la Convention cadre pour la protection des minorités nationales était ouverte à la signature. Sans définir précisément la notion de minorité nationale, il s'agissait de protéger les minorités ethniques, linguistiques, culturelles ou religieuses qui vivent sur le territoire des États membres de notre organisation. En effet, des modifications du tracé des frontières entre deux ou plusieurs États ont pu aboutir à la présence de minorités au sein de ces États. Parfois, ces minorités sont présentes depuis des siècles sans pour autant s'assimiler à la population majoritaire. Je pense notamment aux Roms. Ces populations ont gardé des spécificités culturelles et linguistiques qui doivent être respectées. Leur intégration est dès lors essentielle pour garantir la stabilité sociale et la paix. Toutefois, la définition de minorité nationale reste problématique. Il faudrait définir quels critères permettent de considérer qu'un groupe représente une minorité nationale. Pour ma part, suivant la conception française en la matière, je considère qu'en France, il n'existe pas de minorité nationale, car la République transcende les particularismes éventuels. Je rappelle que l'article 1 de la Constitution française dispose que, je cite, « La France est une République indivisible, laïque, démocratique et sociale. Elle assure l'égalité devant la loi de tous les citoyens, sans distinction d'origine, de race ou de religion. » Fin de citation. C'est pour cela que la France n'a pas signé la Convention cadre pour la protection des minorités nationales. Selon l'avis du Conseil d'État, cette Convention remet en cause les principes constitutionnels du droit français. De plus, la Convention prévoit un droit d'utiliser les langues minoritaires dans les rapports avec l'administration, ce que la Constitution française ne permet pas, son article 2 précisant, que le français est la langue de la République. Au-delà de ces considérations juridiques, opérer des distinctions sur les critères ethniques ou religieux revient à segmenter la population au lieu de la rassembler. Concernant les populations immigrées, elles ne devraient pas être considérées comme des minorités nationales car elles ont vocation 
à s'intégrer ou à s'assimiler à l'état d'accueil. Bien que la France n'ait pas ratifié la Convention cadre et ne reconnaisse pas de minorité sur son territoire, notre Constitution garantit des droits égaux pour chacun dans un cadre où l'état de droit est respecté grâce notamment aux institutions judiciaires. Enfin, l'enseignement de langue régionale a été développé. Nous venons d'ailleurs d'adopter une proposition de loi relative à la protection patrimoniale des langues régionales et à leur promotion. Les objectifs de la Convention sont donc bien atteints. Je vous remercie. Merci, monsieur. La parole est désormais à monsieur Öztavli de Turquie. Non Il est connecté Non. Alors, on va passer à Madame Olafling d'Irlande. La parole est à vous. Thank you, Madam Chair. And I wish to commend the Rapporteur for her report on preserving minority rights, which warns of rising hate speech, insufficient levels of communication and education in minority languages, and how states need to consult with minority groups to inform policies and legislation. And I want to wholeheartedly endorse and support the recommendations that she makes on behalf of the Irish delegation. As we know, the Framework Convention, which was adopted in 1994, sets out rights enjoyed by persons belonging to national minorities, as well as obligations to be respected by the state parties. And that was something that my own country adopted in 1999. We must all continue to call on all of our member states to respect, protect and promote the human rights of persons belonging to minorities, such as national, ethnic, religious and linguistic minorities in international fora. Human rights dialogues are also a key instrument for EU bilateral agreement. And the EU, of course, uses these dialogues to regularly promote the rights of persons belonging to minorities. The Ireland also uses its voice at multilateral fora to promote and protect the rights of persons belonging to minority groups. For example, in 2020, Ireland made recommendations to Bulgaria under the Universal Periodic Review Mechanism at the UN Human Rights Council and encouraged Bulgaria to continue to strengthen and implement legislation that would protect vulnerable members of society, including those belonging to minority and Roma communities. And additionally, Ireland co-sponsored resolutions on the rights of persons belonging to minority groups at the 43rd session of the Human Rights Council in March 2020 and at the 74th session of the UN General Assembly in September 2019. The Irish Anti-Racism Committee is an independent committee established by government in June 2020 to develop a national action plan against racism for Ireland. And only last week, my government has introduced hate crime legislation as we were a complete outlier within Europe in not having this. Of course, the committee's work is also informed by the EU action plan against racism. At the 2019 iteration of the UN Forum on Minority Issues, Ireland's nominee Anastasia Crickley co-chaired the forum, which focused on education, language and the human rights of minorities. We continue to support all of these very important issues and I look forward to working with the rapporteur in terms of of the way forward. Thank you, Chair. Merci, Madame. Nous allons retenter la connexion avec Monsieur Euslavli de Turquie, s'il est là.
Can you hear me now? Dear President, dear colleagues, first of all, I would like to thank the Madam Reporter for her report on this critical subject. Legal, political and psychological challenges for the protection of minority rights in Europe has been extensively researched and presented in this report. As mentioned in the report during the 90s, there was a strong focus on the rights of the nation minorities. And also, these years were the years that Council of Europe's Framework Convention for the Protection of the Nation Minorities opened for signature. However, today, xenophobia, discrimination, racism and Islamophobia have increased and gained a new dimension. This new dimension is the targeting not only the refugees and migrants, but also the citizens of the host country who belong a national minority. No need to say that overwhelming majority of the refugees and migrants in Europe are Muslims. Besides, Turkish community in West Europe constitutes the majority of Muslim population in Europe and is directly affected by these adverse trends. The attacks and arsons targeting Turkish community members in West European countries have been constantly increasing in recent years. They are facing discrimination based on their cultural and religious identity. Many Turkish people living in European countries are getting excluded from politics, media and academics. Another issue is the Crimean Tatars. As you know, Crimean Tatars are subjected to grave human rights violations. Therefore, I am very pleased that they were included with, within the scope of this report. One thing that I may kindly ask from the Madam Reporter to make the definition of the term national minority. Who is national minority and who belong to a group called national minority? The same thing goes to the term religious minority. I think these questions need to be answered clearly in the report because only after making this definition, we, we can make and see the difference between these groups and the refugees or the migrants. As the last word, I want to say that I strongly support the statement that all human rights should be understood as minority rights. And only if we see these rights as human rights, trust can be established between national minorities and European societies. Thank you for your attention. Merci, Monsieur. Je donne désormais la parole à Madame Zora Bayan d'Arménie. Uh, merci, uh, chers collègues. Madame Kovac, vous avez préparé un excellent rapport sur l'importance de la protection de l'identité, de la culture et de la religion des minorités nationales en Europe. Aujourd'hui, je parlerai de l'Artsakh, dont la partie majeure a passé sous le contrôle de l'Azerbaïdjan en vertu de l'accord du 10 novembre. Aujourd'hui, je vais attirer votre attention, chers collègues, une fois de plus sur une autre alarme concernant la destruction des monuments culturels arméniens anciens de la plusieurs siècles en Artsakh. Église, Khachkar, monastère, vandalisme, et je m'adresserai à notre Assemblée pour former une mission d'observation visiter les colonies arméniennes sous contrôle azerbaïdjanais et voir l'état du patrimoine culturel arménien. Après la signature de l'accord de 10, le 10 novembre, les militants azerbaïdjanais ont immédiatement profané à Chouchi le monument aux victimes du génocide arménien, l'église verte à Chouchi. En plus, pendant la guerre, l'église Razanchetsots a été deux fois bombardée. Il y a quelques jours, le chef BBC a montré un reportage dans lequel les journalistes enquêtaient sur la disparition de l'église sur Zora de l'agglomération Mechakavan. Chers collègues, ce rapport fait également référence à l'initiation à la haine ethnique et je vais vous présenter les déclarations racistes et intos du président de l'Azerbaïdjan au cours des derniers mois qui n'ont encore reçu aucune évaluation. Nous continuerons à chasser ces mentors arméniens. Pendant 30 ans, 30 ans, Artsakh était entre les mains des monstres sauvages, entre les mains des bêtes sauvages, entre les mains des chacals. Nous avons réussi à isoler l'Arménie de tous les programmes internationaux et régionaux. Ce sont les paroles d'Aliyev. La nouvelle génération a grandi avec un sentiment de haine envers l'ennemi. Et le résultat de cette guerre sont le résultat de cette éducation. Éducation a déclaré Aliyev lors d'un congrès 
du Parti Nouvel Azerbaïdjan le 5 mars. Voilà, chers collègues, la face de la 7N. Voilà. Et encore un autre exemple, euh, le mot bien connu d'Aliyev. Nous, nous expulserons les Arméniens comme des chiens. C'est exactement comme Iti Govan. Ils ont appelé leur nouveau drone de production comme Iti Govan, chers collègues. Dans les territoires arméniens, sous le contrôle de l'Azerbaïdjan, le patrimoine culturel arménien qui fait partie de la culture mondiale est en danger. Des centaines d'églises, des monastères, des hachkars. Ce vandalisme doit être arrêté, sinon il sera trop, car il était trop, euh, trop tard dans le cas de la destruction des Khachkars arméniens médiévaux dans le territoire de Jura de Nakhijevan. Merci. Merci Madame. Je rappelle que le thème est de préserver les minorités nationales en Europe. Euh, pas forcément euh, d'extrapoler. Je donne donc la parole à M. Meresco d'Ukraine. Je vous en prie, oui. Um, excuse me, uh, dear chairman. I just, I'm pretty disappointed right now because yesterday, as a new member of the delegation, new newbie to the Council of Europe, we've been invited to to have an induction with with your team, and there we've been given a book with rules and procedures, and one of the basic things that was told that you should respect each other. Now, at the very at this stage. Here in this room, my colleague insulted the whole nation of Azerbaijan, calling, it, calling us wild animals. She insulted our president, and I'm kindly asking you to explain me, is it what European values are? Can you please explain our colleague that this is not the language that should be used in this room? Thank you. Um. C'est vrai qu'ici, nous avons un lien d'expression, une liberté d'expression, mais je rappelle qu'il faut le faire dans le respect mutuel. Et c'est la raison pour laquelle j'aimerais que ce respect mutuel se fasse entre toutes les personnes et tous les peuples que nous représentons. Ça me paraît être la moindre des choses pour continuer à travailler ensemble pour les valeurs du Conseil de l'Europe. Voilà ce que j'ai à dire. Je continue donc avec euh, Monsieur Meresco d'Ukraine. Donc il n'y a pas Monsieur Meresco. Euh, nous allons passer à Madame Martinez Ferro d'Espagne. Est-elle là Merci Madame la Présidente. Eh, quiero dar las gracias a la señora Kovacs por eh, este excelente informe que, que ha presentado hoy aquí. Eh, aunque es un informe que efectivamente pues no, no tiene efecto en, en España, no tiene necesidad. En España, gracias a la Constitución de, de 1978, tenemos cuatro lenguas oficiales, una de ellas que corresponde a todo el territorio, que es el español, y tres, el gallego, el catalán y el euskera, que eh, se utilizan en otras tres comunidades autónomas que tienen lengua propia. En España estas lenguas se utilizan, se estudian eh, y se protegen en un plano de, de perfecta igualdad. Y digo esto a diferencia de lo que ha dicho un eh, diputado anterior, Gómez Reino, eh, con relación concretamente a, a la comunidad autónoma de la que yo provengo, que es Galicia, en, en donde también ha utilizado un término de minoría nacional, que como han dicho algunos otros eh, diputados que me han precedido en el uso de la palabra, no queda muy claro a qué se refiere exactamente esos términos de minorías eh, nacionales. Y también recordamos la importancia que tiene no incitar al odio y no levantar eh, polémicas que no existen. Tanto en Galicia, como en Cataluña, como en el País Vasco, eh, las lenguas eh, propias se utilizan indistintamente, y son estudiadas con total normalidad. Existen incluso televisiones eh, propias que utilizan dichas lenguas y hay un, una pujante industria audiovisual propia. Por lo tanto, agradecemos mucho el informe, pero efectivamente en España no hay necesidad de proteger estas minorías lingüísticas porque están absolutamente protegidas gracias a la Constitución del 78. Merci, si, madame. Euh, je donne la parole à M. Bergeron du Canada, s'il est là. Mm -hmm. 
C'est loin le Canada. Bon, on va. Bonjour. Ah, ça y est. Bonjour, désolé, petit problème technique. Alors, merci, Madame la Présidente. Bonjour, chers collègues. Je suis très heureux de pouvoir m'exprimer aujourd'hui au sujet de la protection des minorités nationales en Europe, qui de tout temps a constitué un enjeu extrêmement sensible et donc des plus importants. Je tiens notamment à remercier euh, la Commission et la rapporteuse, Madame Elvira Kovacs, pour leur excellent travail sur la question. Je suis du Québec, une nation de langue française sur un continent majoritairement anglophone. Les Québécoises et Québécois sont fiers de leur identité nationale unique. Les Québécoises et Québécois reconnaissent l'importance de protéger la diversité linguistique, ethnique et culturelle. Les Québécoises et Québécois sont également fiers d'avoir affirmé la laïcité de l'État et bâti une société accueillante et respectueuse de la diversité. Le peuple québécois partage son territoire avec 11 nations autochtones, les Abénaquis, Algonquins, Atikamekw, Cris, Huron, Innu, Malécite, Micmac, Mohawk, Naskapi et Inuit. Il est lui-même né de la conjonction des populations françaises qui se sont établies sur le territoire à compter du 17e siècle et de celles qui sont arrivées par la suite en provenance du Royaume-Uni, puis d'un peu partout à travers le monde. Bien que la langue officielle et commune de l'ensemble des Québécoises et Québécois soit le français, on retrouve au Québec une minorité nationale de langue anglaise qui dispose de droits inaliénables, se manifestant notamment par des services et institutions qui lui sont propres et dont la plupart est financée par l'État. Au Canada, la gestion de la diversité passe par un modèle qu'on appelle le multiculturalisme. Au Québec, on parle plutôt d'interculturalisme. L'historien et sociologue Gérard Bouchard explique que l'interculturalisme comme pluralisme intégrateur est un modèle axé sur la recherche d'équilibre qui entend tracer une voie entre l'assimilation et la segmentation et qui, dans ce but, met l'accent sur l'intégration, les interactions et la promotion d'une culture commune dans le respect des droits et de la diversité. Le modèle interculturel québécois est évidemment influencé par le fait que la nation québécoise est elle-même minoritaire au sein du Canada et du continent nord-américain. Comme l'indique Bouchard, il est possible et nécessaire de conjuguer dans une même dynamique d'appartenance et de développement les aspirations identitaires de la majorité et l'orientation pluraliste. Ce que le modèle laïque québécois démontre, c'est qu'il est tout à fait possible pour un peuple d'affirmer fièrement sa spécificité qui repose notamment sur la présence en son sein de minorités linguistiques, ethniques, religieuses et nationales venues enrichir le tronc commun culturel et historique qu'il définit. Comme on peut le lire dans le préambule de la Convention cadre pour la protection des minorités nationales, la création d'un climat de tolérance et de dialogue est nécessaire pour permettre à la diversité culturelle d'être une source ainsi qu'un facteur non de division, mais d'enrichissement pour chaque société. Je crois à cet égard que le Québec est la preuve que la diversité peut faire la force d'un peuple. Je vous remercie de votre attention. Merci, monsieur. La parole est désormais à monsieur Fabrice Ny de la Fédération de Russie. S'il est en ligne. Il faut que vous demandiez la parole. Sinon, on ne peut pas y arriver. C'est bon. Спасибо, госпожа председатель. Эльвира Кович, безусловно, проделала большую работу. Я отмечаю, что и доклад, и приложение к нему, и проект рекомендаций находятся в плее. ...that the eight remaining nations who have not yet ratified this agreement should proceed to do so without further delay. She is quite right that ratification does not of itself guarantee success, but the solidarity of all our council members standing together would add significantly to the credibility of the report. Nor does ratification alone achieve everything that her report asks for. Each nation, as best suits its own inter internal legal arrangements, needs to incorporate the report's recommendations into law. Even that step is unlikely to be sufficient. 
constant monitoring will certainly be needed to ensure that the human rights of individuals, groups, and the collective are best undergirded. Ms. Kovacs has put these steps forward with great clarity. Even though our continent is currently witnessing a movement away from the ideals set out in this report, our endorsement of its findings will surely serve, at the very least, to challenge this regrettable backward slide. One note could have been sounded with greater strength. As well as the focusing down on measures to strengthen provision in this area, the report could have struck a more uplifting note. Difference is to be celebrated, and the celebration of difference could change the situations we are worried about. What can be done to illustrate the enhancement of public life by the contribution of the minority groups being referred to? Well, cultural festivals, naming cities of culture, intercommunity social activities, joint intercommunal act action for justice and progress, all these and so much more could demonstrate what the report calls a shared sense of belonging. They could help to de-other the other. In the words of Václav Havel, which we heard this morning, they'd allow us to look up to the stars. I was delighted at the place given to my native Wales in this report. All my life I've been affected by its linguistic history. In my youth, I and my family suffered from exclusion from the Welsh language. In recent times, however, I've quite simply rejoiced at the change in its status and fortunes. The Welsh devolved government is to be congratulated on its policies and its achievements in this area. Ms. Kovacs was unable to visit Wales because of the pandemic. One day, when it's all over, I hope I may have the pleasure of her company on an actual visit there. It'll be a case of Croeso i Gymru, welcome to Wales. I'm certain her eyes will be opened on a land flowing with milk and honey, little short of paradise. Once again, I thank her for this illuminating and constructive report. Merci, monsieur. Uh, monsieur Poitschek de Pologne, s'il est là. Je ne le vois pas. Non. Donc, euh, nous allons entendre euh, Madame Bardina d'Ukraine, suivie ensuite de euh, Monsieur euh, Molazada d'Azerbaïdjan. Dear colleagues, dear Madame Rapporteur, thanks uh, for report uh, preparation. The issue of national minorities uh, is extremely important for Ukraine, and Ukrainian authorities have been working on strengthening dialogue with representatives of national minorities for a long time. Я депутат українського парламента, я говорю на українському і русском языках, і ніхто не ущемляє мої языкові права. For the Ukrainian delegation, it is crucial that Madame Rapporteur has paid her attention to the illegal occupation of the Crimean Peninsula by the Russian Federation. Since the beginning of the occupation in 2014, Russia has been pursuing the policy of suppression and Russian illegal authorities have been committing multiple human rights viola violations, especially against Crimean Tatars. In the discussed report, Madame uh, Rapporteur has mentioned the bi uh, bilateral meetings with the Ukrainian government and civil society organizations that were held uh, in November 2020. It is very valuable for us that such meetings were initiated and direct dialogue with national stakeholders was established. According to the Constitution, Ukraine is continue promoting the development of the ethnic, cultural, linguistic and religious identity of of indigenous peoples and national minorities in Ukraine. I also want to note the important issue of Roma national minority because it is one of the most underrepresented group across the member states whose basic rights worsened during the quarantine. Representatives of Roma communities admitted limitation of their rights, for example, to health and education. 
Despite the crisis caused by pandemic, I would like to note some positive developments. Over the two past years, in Ukraine, we organized Roma political schools supported by the Council of Europe. And Ukrainian parliament and government representatives have been actively involved into these educational courses. As a result, more than 30 representatives of Roma's communities participated in local elections in October 2020 in Ukraine, and some of them have become deputies of local councils. So when we talk about protection of the rights of national minorities in Europe, we need to promote such good practices of political empowerment, because political and civil participation are key for human rights protection. Thank you. Merci, Madame. Monsieur Moulazada, d'Azerbaïdjan, c'est à vous. Thank you very much. Madam Chair, leading idea in Europe or toward a ethnic, religious minority, racial minority is a tolerance. It means I don't like you, but I'm patient. But we definitely believe that only respect, only intercultural exchange will change environment. Nuremberg process made a strong decision not allow glorifying of Nazism and SS. But in the middle of Yerevan, we have monument to Nazi commander who killed Jews and uh, Soviet citizens in occupied territory. Uh, that's why, according to an American investigation agency, the most anti-Semitic country in Europe is Armenia. More than 70% of population is anti-Semitic. That's why just recently in center of Yerevan, uh, they destroyed a Jewish cemetery and also uh, used a Nazi uh, symbol on that. Uh, we think that uh, a very important issue just to stop glorifying of Nazism, growing of Nazism, created a problem in Germany when uh, kids with Kippa attacking by people. 60,000 people of Jews uh, left France. It's a very dangerous signal, but at the same time, anti-Islamism creating a very strong problem, like uh, burning of mosques. We think that only respect to different race, to different religious, will create a normal environment. Uh, Armenia is only one mono-ethnic country in Europe because representative of all uh, religious, all ethnic group were cleansed. Azerbaijani was the last group, hundreds of thousands of Azerbaijani brutally cleansed from territory of Armenia. And uh, we think that country which based on hatred has no right to speak about uh, any uh, tolerance. And also, very important thing is uh, cultural heritage. An occupied territory of Azerbaijan, all Azerbaijani cultures, cultural heritage was destroyed, completely destroyed also all cities, museums. And I think that it's a very dangerous signal for Europe. We need respect. We need help for reconciliation. But what we have? We have mines. We have a terrorist group who coming and trying to kill civil people. Uh, we, we definitely believe that language of hatred and uh, Madame Zohrabian show it uh, now in Council of Europe what kind of hatred they have. It's not a future of Armenia. We for the peace, for reconciliation, and also building multiculturalism, even in a mono-ethnic country. Thank you, madam. Merci, monsieur. Uh, je donne la parole à monsieur Mikanadze de Géorgie, qui ensuite sera suivi de monsieur Jafarov d'Azerbaïdjan. Yes. Thank you, Madam President. Georgia is a multi-ethnic and multicultural country. 
more than 13% of the total population, apart from Russia-occupied regions of Abkhazia and South Ossetia, are ethnic minorities. Georgia has a positive experience in maintaining the centuries-old tradition of cultural diversity, coexistence in a tolerant environment, and development. Georgian legislation guarantees elimination of discrimination, protection of human rights, ensuring equality, which has been faster developed for the past years under the state strategy for civic equality and integration and respective action plan. In the past years, a range of unique instruments have been introduced and faster developed within various dimensions of civic integration, namely special higher and vocational educational and state language learning programs for ethnic minority representatives successfully operate. Concrete initiatives are implemented for faster improvement of participation of ethnic minority representatives in civic and decision-making processes. Up to 300 non-Georgian schools and sectors function. Special priority is given to gender mainstreaming, which implies an effective response to the specific needs of ethnic minority women in the light of information awareness raising on protection against violence, as well as gender equality and their empowerment. Ethnic minorities have access to information and media, also in their native languages. Since 2018, seven language information web portals were launched under the umbrella of the public broadcaster. Live rebroadcasting of Georgian version news programs with, with simultaneous translation in Armenian and Azerbaijani languages is operational on a daily basis through regional TV channels. Armenian and Azerbaijani language newspapers are published with the state support. Access of ethnic minorities to state social economic programs and services is well ensured through large-scale door-to-door awareness raising campaigns carried out on a regular basis for ethnic minority population in their native languages. In 2017-2020, 331 meetings on Georgia's European and Euro-Atlantic integration perspectives were conducted in 259 villages attended by more than 7,000 ethnic minority beneficiaries. The government has launched large-scale bilingual information campaign on COVID-19 related issues through various alternative means of communication in the regions densely populated by ethnic minorities. Video clips on the COVID-19 hygiene recommendations, measures of its prevention and traveling abroad, translated and disseminated in minority languages. Bilingual SMS messages on lockdown measures regulations sent to ethnic minorities. Up to 600,000 printed information materials delivered by door-to-door -door principal. Bilingual operators employed on governmental hotline. Together with non-discrimination and equal treatment, minority rights involve preservation of cultures. The state supports theaters, museums, and cultural centers of ethnic minority representatives, as well as various cultural activities through the supporting ethnic minority culture programs, which aims at promoting and popularizing cultures and traditions of ethnic minority groups, as well as intercultural dialogue. Civic integration is an ongoing process in Georgia. Therefore, we go faster for implementation of every unique and some new mechanism of integration that will bring tangible results in various directions of civic integration, be it access to, equa uh, to quality education, yes. empowerment of state language knowledge, civic and political participation, or social economic opportunities. Thank you. Oui, je vous écoute. Vous avez votre micro ouvert. Ouais. Ah, OK. Um, I don't like point of order, Madam Chair, but I am obliged to do because it's a very sensitive issue. My colleague from Azerbaijan, Molizad, Mr. Molizad, has said that in Armenia, Jewish cemetery has been destroyed. It's falsification. It's not true. Armenians respect tragedy of Jewish people because we have common history. We both uh, people um, uh, had genocide in our history. And there is monument of Holocaust in Armenia, and we respect all Armenians. We have a special relation with Jewish people. So it's, it's really big falsification. And uh, I, I say this point of order because it can uh, play with feelings of Jewish people. Thank you very much. Excuse me. Nous avons bien entendu votre point de vue. Il ne s'agit pas vraiment d'une motion d'ordre ou d'un rappel au règlement. Mais avant de poursuivre nos travaux, j'aimerais quand même dire que euh, jusqu'à il y a quelques orateurs, nous avions un, euh, des débats qui étaient tout à fait mesurés où, et où tout le monde s'exprimait. 
J'aimerais qu'on arrête de jouer au ping-pong pour les insultes et l'irrespect. Je trouve que c'est dommage de terminer ce débat de cette manière-là. Je crois que Mme Kovacs ne mérite pas ça. Voilà. J'en je, ai fini pour dire ce que j'ai à dire. Je continue donc. Je vais vous laisser la parole, M. Jafarov, mais avant, je voudrais juste demander à Mme Golubeva de Lettonie de se tenir prête à reprendre la parole puisqu'elle est en ligne. Merci. C'est à vous, monsieur. Merci, madame le président. I fully agree with you that every parliamentary member of this assembly should respect the rules and should refrain from uh, disturbing the work of the assembly. And I would like to inform the assembly that Azerbaijan is a multicultural state. And multiculturalism is a way of life in Azerbaijan. For centuries, different religions and cultures coexisted peacefully. Persons belonging to various ethnic groups lived and created together. Even now, there are 30,000 Armenians living in Azerbaijan. However, there is no single Azerbaijani living in Armenia. Even my own family forced to leave Armenia. Monoethnism is their policy. We respect that. But they should refrain from damaging post-conflict cooperation and reconciliation efforts. Everybody knows that the post-conflict cooperation and development is a painful and hard process. So we should examine our own attitude toward those opportunities. And secondly, in 2008, Azerbaijan started, initiated new process, invited Minister of Cultures of Member States from Council of Europe and Organization of Islamic Cooperation to discuss the prospects dialogue. And we have been organizing these sessions over 10 years. And this shows our commitment to multiculturalism. And as my colleague from Armenia, Avetisian, here, I would like to address him that, you know, hand over the mine plans. You said that you are ready, and we haven't requested the mine plans. Right now, I'm requesting from you, hand over the mine plans. This assembly talks about the detained criminals, but forgets about the civilians killed by mines planted by Armenian Garabakh. And finally, I would like to say that reconciliation of Armenian origins in Khankandi, Khojale, and Agdara is a matter of time. It will happen. And I want to say again that we consider those Armenians as our citizens. Thank you. Je vous... C'est pour une motion d'ordre Thank you very much. Uh, a colleague has named me, so that's why I get a direct response. First of all, when you are murdering people in Nagorno-Karabakh, that doesn't help them to understand you as uh, people who can coexist peacefully. When you are chopping their heads off in Nagorno-Karabakh, of those people that you are calling now who lost brothers, sisters, uh, mothers, grandfathers, it's not very helpful. Secondly, on the same topic of that the National Advisory Committee made, and according to the Azerbaijani census, there's only 200 Armenians, of, according to your own census. And the Framework Agreement Commission has Monsieur, mentioned that Azerbaijan has not... Ce n'est pas, pas une motion d'ordre. Nous avons bien Sorry. entendu votre point de vue. Je ne considère pas qu'il s'agisse d'un rappel au règlement. Je le dis et je le redis. Nous poursuivons nos travaux. Il y a une liberté d'expression dans le respect des uns et des autres, mais on n'arrivera jamais à avancer dans, dans ce contexte-là. Donc, je vais passer la parole à Mme Golubeva, qui doit attendre, qui est donc de Lettonie, qui doit être en ligne, normalement. Um, I think the 
is a highly important uh, is a highly important uh, document of the Council of Europe, and it is very important for this assembly to maintain it. I'd like to make a few points about the protection of national minority languages in the education system of my own country, Latvia. Um, Latvia is successfully balancing the maintenance of mother tongue of national minorities in the education system with uh, support for a uh, better proficiency of all students in the national language, in the Latvian language. Uh, in the last two years, Latvia has implemented an education reform which continues to support minority students in maintaining their mother tongue while also increasing their proficiency in Latvian through a transition to a larger proportion of instruction in the state language in school. It is implemented gradually and with up-to-date methodological support. This education reform does not suspend national minority education programs. They are implemented as bilingual programs and they will be implemented also in the future, both in public and private schools. Throughout and after the reform, Latvia will continue to support bilingual programs in primary and lower secondary school in seven languages, Russian, Polish, Hebrew, Ukrainian, Estonian, Lithuanian and Belarusian. So let me make this point. Um, the current approach in the Latvian education system is in fact a good example of how to support the mother tongue of minority students in the education system and recognize it. And at the same time, um, a thoughtful approach to making sure that they have full proficiency of the language of the labor market, civil society and government, and can participate equally in making the future of the nation. Thank you. Merci, excusez-moi. Euh, je donne la parole maintenant à M. Gadirli d'Azerbaïdjan, qui sera suivi ensuite par euh, M. Bashkin de la Fédération de Russie. À ce titre, je voulais savoir si vous étiez d'accord. Il nous reste très peu d'orateurs. Il nous en reste cinq après, M. Bashkin. Est-ce que vous acceptez de rester quelques minutes en plus pour qu'on puisse tous leur permettre de parler Sinon, euh, on s'arrêtera là. Si vous en êtes d'accord, on va continuer comme ça. Donc, euh, je reviens à M. Gadirli. C'est à vous euh, la parole, monsieur. Thank you, Madam Chair. Dear colleagues, um, <coughs> I thank uh, Rapporteur for the very good report. Um, I will only uh, make very few comments. Um, I find uh, the phrase national minority rather unfortunate and confusing. Um, if you compare it with the Article 27, for example, the, if you compare with the language of Article 27 on the International Covenant on Political, Civil and Political Rights, that text doesn't use the phrase national minority. It says about, it talks about national, ethnic, religious, and linguistic minorities. The Genocide Convention, which defines uh, this crime, also doesn't use both national and ethnic group, clearly making a distinction between them. Because national refers to all citizens of a state. And when you say national minority, it, it doesn't make any sense, actually. It, it contains a contradiction in itself. Now, the report is very good, indeed. Um, it could have been better, for example, it, if it, in, it included certain um, other problems, uh, for example, uh, the problem of minority within minorities. This is not about diversity. That issue is reflected uh, in, in the report. The rapporteur mentions that within a particular ethnic minority, there can be different uh, diverse groups. I am talking about a structural problem. It exists in countries where ethnic minority has an autonomy or is a federal unit, as the case may be, of a single state. And within that particular territorial unity, uh, uh, this within a particular territorial unit, ethnic minority itself becomes an ethnic majority and can discriminate against its own uh, uh, ethnic minorities. Uh, this report says nothing about that. Uh, and also, there is another problem, um, not a problem actually, but uh, the report could have been richer if it also described the situation where a particular group, ethnic minority, belongs to religious majority, whereas 
a majority of a religious minority belongs to ethnic majority. This may sound rather confusing to some, but believe me, this is not a hypothetical case. Uh, there are certain examples of that. Now, um, I didn't really want anything about Armenia, but I cannot refrain myself from making one small, very short comment. I, uh, it, it, isn't it ironic that Armenian delegates talk about problems of ethnic minorities in other countries when Armenia itself is a mono-ethnic country? And it, mono-ethnicity is not a product of natural development. They became uh, mono-ethnic by expelling other ethnic groups from their territory. They also ethnically cleansed not only their own territory, but the territory they used to occupy. I mean, the territories of Azerbaijan. It seems like they don't need any other population. Thank you. Je donne la parole maintenant à Monsieur Bashkin de la Fédération de Russie, puis ensuite ce sera Monsieur Korlachen de Roumanie. Il faut mettre le son. On ne vous entend pas. Il faut demander la parole. Vous avez demandé la parole et mettez le Ouvrez le micro peut-être. On va prendre quelqu'un d'autre. On essaiera à nouveau tout à l'heure avec M. Bakshin. M. Korletchan de Roumanie. Euh, je vous remercie ah. vivement, euh, Madame la Présidente, de votre euh, proposition euh, tout à fait correcte du point de vue euh, donner accès aux intervenants de prendre la parole. Euh, je vais continuer en anglais puisque le, le projet de résolution dont j'avais accès était en, en anglais. Uh, after reading uh, uh, carefully the draft report and draft resolution, I have discovered uh, important positive parts uh, that I will appreciate. And also, in the same time, I am saying with regret uh, some uh, uh, uncorrect uh, parts that I will mention immediately. The positive part, <clears throat> it's extremely important to relaunch the attention and the political commitment of the Europeans concerning the protection of uh, national minorities in a complicated Europe. Secondly, it's important to make reference to these objective European standards which are determined by the Framework Convention for the Protection of National minority, Minorities and in the same time uh, to the process of ratification. Uh, I open a parenthesis, uh, nevertheless asking uh, France, for instance, to violate its own constitution, uh, tradition, institutional, uh, legal, uh, cultural traditions uh, will uh, be something rather innovative. But in any case, uh, making reference to the Framework Convention, it's extremely important. A Framework Convention who establishes the protection of national minorities at European level, uh, making reference to the individual uh, rights for the protection, not collective uh, rights. Uh, the less positive uh, part, the negative uh, part. I will uh, make reference, first of all, to paragraph seven that uh, it's true, in a more sophisticated manner, is making uh, reference to the so-called collective uh, rights of uh, national minor minorities. This is a clear violation of the standards, legal standards established by the Framework Convention, which establishes once again the individual rights of persons belonging to national minorities, which otherwise are quoted correctly in the same draft uh, resolution. This old obsession coming from some part of Central Europe and some related uh, uh, kin minorities coming after the uh, Trianon Treaty from 1920. This old obsession is generating this uh, formula which is absurd, collective rights for uh, letting autonomy based on ethnic routes, that means separation. Last but not least, the situation of national minorities in Ukraine, which are hostages to a Russian-Ukrainian conflict, means the issue of education in mother tongue, including for the Romanian minority, it's an issue of concern. Thank you very much, uh, Madam President. Merci. On réessaye avec M. Bashkin de la Fédération de Russie, s'il est en ligne, avec un micro ouvert. 
меня слышно. Проблема защиты прав национальных меньшинств относится к числу одной из наиболее острых в современной Европе. Дискриминацию минористов проиллюстрирую на примере подавления языков этих групп. Например, законодательство Украины в нарушении европейских конвенций и собственной конституции стало причиной ущемления законных интересов национальных меньшинств, носителей польского, русского, венгерского и других языков. Венецианская комиссия в 2017 году критиковала украинский закон об образовании и отметила, что менее благоприятное отношение к этим языкам трудно каким-либо образом представить вследствие чего возникает вопрос об их дискриминации. Несмотря на критику, атака на языки национальных меньшинств продолжилась. Вступила в силу новая форма украинского закона об обеспечении функционирования украинского языка как государственного. Согласно ему, вся сфера обслуживания в стране в обязательном порядке переходит только на украинский язык. Естественно, соблюдение языковых прав национальных меньшинств не умаляет необходимости знания государственных языков. Например, того же украинского языка, являющегося бесценным вкладом в копилку культурных ценностей современной цивилизации. Но и недостаточный уровень владения языком не может быть основанием для ограничения гражданских прав. Как пример, напомню о заключительных намечаниях Комитета ООН по экономическим, социальным и культурным правам по Эстонии от 2019 года, в которых выражается обеспокоенность карательным подходом к соблюдению закона о языке и, цитирую, систематической дискриминации части населения из-за недостаточного уровня владения эстонским языком. По-прежнему остро стоит проблема отсутствия у них граждан, подавляющее большинство которых русские, ряда политических, социальных и экономических прав в Латвии и Эстонии. В докладе идет речь о нарушениях языкового права национальных меньшинств. Но, на мой взгляд, крайне важным является то, что перечисленные в докладе проблемы – это не проявление переходного периода или нехватки кадров, а это целенаправленная государственная политика. К сожалению, доклад не дал принципиальную оценку языковому геноциду, системной, организуемой государством дискриминации негосударственных языков национальных меньшинств на Украине и в странах Балтии. Тем не менее, мы подчеркиваем крайнюю важность поднятой темы и осознаем необходимость продолжения диалога. В заключение предположу, что коллеги Кравчук и Бардина давно не были в Крыму, иначе они увидели бы, что за последние семь лет в Крыму построено в три раза больше мечети, чем предшествующие 50 лет, и строятся самые крупные в Европе и крымско-татарский язык наряду с русским и украинским по конституции Крыма стал государственным. Изучать его можно абсолютно в любой школе Крыма. Из-за того, что количество детей, изучающих этот язык, увеличилось, власти республики приняли решение построить еще шесть крымско-татарских школ. Любая из вас, уважаемые коллеги, может посетить Крым и лично убедиться в правоте моих утверждений. Благодарю вас за внимание. Merci, monsieur. Je passe la, la parole à madame Babuc de la République de Moldova, qui sera suivie ensuite par madame Monsion du Canada. Merci, madame la présidente. Tout d'abord, je voudrais saluer chaleureusement le rapport de madame Elvira Kovac, mais avec quelques remarques pertinentes. La Convention cadre pour la protection des minorités nationales est un instrument essentiel qui assure la vision commune de la préservation de la stabilité, de la sécurité démocratique et de la paix en Europe. C'est un instrument bien modeste mais puissant qui contribue à la stabilité des pays, y compris mon pays, la République de Moldova. D'autre part, la bonne compréhension et l'application des normes dépendent également des évaluations adéquates du comité consultatif, raison pour laquelle la République de Moldova a soutenu le processus de réforme visant à ajuster et à renforcer la Convention cadre. Il est particulièrement important de renforcer l'exactitude des opinions par le biais d'un dialogue confidentiel compte tenu des défis et des difficultés auxquels les pays sont confrontés. Nous espérons que cette procédure permettra de résoudre toutes les positions divergentes entre le comité consultatif et les pays concernés avant l'adoption du texte final de l'avis, laissant une voie plus douce pour l'adoption de la résolution. Lors de la discussion sur la minorité nationale, nous devons être très prudents car il existe de nombreuses situations où, par exemple, sont touchées des questions d'administration publique où il s'agit du 
une question souveraine d'un État concerné. C'est particulièrement le cas, par exemple, de projet de loi sur le statut ethnoculturel de la région Taraklia de mon pays. Dans ce sens, on apprécie le rôle de la Commission de Venise. Suivant la logique de la Commission de Venise, toute demande de garantie supplémentaire pour un groupe minoritaire spécifique peut créer un précédent pour d'autres groupes minoritaires qui peuvent prétendre à un traitement spécial similaire. Les droits des minorités nationales ont toujours été une question sensible et si elle n'est pas traitée avec diligence, elle peut constituer un défi majeur pour l'intégrité d'un pays. Maintenant, grâce aux règles de la Convention cadre et la bonne volonté des autorités nationales, nous avons des résultats et des bonnes pratiques qui, malheureusement, ne sont pas reflétés suffisamment dans le rapport. Dans le cas de mon pays, tous les groupes ethniques ont vécu et habitent pacifiquement et en bénéficiant de tous les droits. En tant que ministre de l'Éducation, on a promouvé l'éducation dans la langue maternelle des minorités nationales et de la diaspora, y compris les migrants de la deuxième génération, et l'élaboration du programme national d'amélioration du processus d'enseignement de la langue d'État, langue roumaine, aux enfants appartenant aux minorités nationales. Une étape clé de la processus d'amélioration du système de protection des minorités nationales a été l'adoption de la stratégie de consolidation des relations interethniques en République de Moldova pour 2017-2027 et à cet égard, nous apprécions vivement le soutien du Conseil de l'Europe et du bureau de l'OSCE, du Haut commissaire pour les minorités nationales dans les processus de rédaction. Merci. Merci, madame. Euh, avant de passer la parole à madame Motion, je voudrais juste que madame Selik de Turquie et monsieur Adjukovic de Croatie se préparent parce que les deux derniers orateurs seront en ligne également. Madame Motion de Canada, c'est à vous. Merci, Madame la Présidente. Chers collègues, je vous remercie de me donner l'opportunité de prendre la parole aujourd'hui sur la question du respect et de la protection de la diversité linguistique, ethnique, culturelle et nationale de l'Europe. Je voudrais en premier lieu féliciter la rapporteure, Madame Elvira Kovac, pour son travail sur le sujet. Comme vous le savez, la Convention européenne des droits de l'homme interdit formellement la discrimination, y compris celle fondée sur l'appartenance à une minorité nationale. Cette protection a été réaffirmée en 2000 par l'entremise du protocole numéro 12. De même, la Convention cadre pour la protection des minorités nationales reconnaît dans son préambule que la protection des minorités nationales est essentielle à la stabilité, à la sécurité démocratique et à la paix du continent européen. La Convention cadre convient aussi qu'une société ne peut prétendre à être pluraliste et démocratique si elle ne respecte ni ne protège le patrimoine ethnique culturel, linguistique et religieux de sa ou de ses minorités nationales. À ce titre, je crois que l'exemple canadien peut être pertinent aux États plurinationaux d'Europe. En effet, le Canada compte lui-même plusieurs peuples fondateurs, les peuples autochtones, canadiens français, canadiens anglais. Les nouveaux arrivants, c'est-à-dire ces personnes issues de l'immigration plus récente, contribuent également à façonner notre pays depuis plusieurs siècles. Cette diversité a marqué et continue de marquer le développement de la Fédération canadienne. Tout comme la Convention européenne des droits de l'homme, la Charte canadienne des droits et libertés et la Loi canadienne sur les droits de la personne protègent les personnes se trouvant au Canada contre toute forme de discrimination, y compris la discrimination fondée sur l'origine nationale. La Charte canadienne doit notamment être interprétée de façon à coordonner, à concorder plutôt, avec l'objectif de promouvoir le maintien et la valorisation du patrimoine multi multiculturel des Canadiens. Quelques années après l'adoption de cette charte, le multiculturalisme a été identifié comme politique d'État au Canada. Par l'adoption de la loi sur le multiculturalisme, multiculturalisme canadien en 1985, le gouvernement fédéral a en effet reconnu l'importance de maintenir et de valoriser le patrimoine multiculturel des Canadiens. 
Cette loi reconnaît explicitement le can- caractère fondamentalement multiculturel de la société canadienne. Il souligne également le fait que ce caractère constitue une ressource inestimable pour l'avenir du pays. Je suis d'accord, la diversité linguistique, ethnique, culturelle et nationale est une ressource inestimable. Je suis également d'accord avec la Commission. Il importe aujourd'hui, alors qu'on assiste à la montée d'une rhétorique qui stigmatise la différence, de réaffirmer notre engagement commun au respect de la diversité linguistique, ethnique et culturelle. Je vous remercie, chers collègues, de votre attention. Merci, madame. Donc, euh, visiblement, les deux derniers orateurs ne sont pas inscrits. Nous allons donc arrêter là la liste des oratrices et des orateurs qui s'est épuisée tout naturellement plus tôt. Madame la rapporteure, euh, oui, il y a quelqu'un à... Ah, bon, allez. Ah ben, bah, ils reviennent. Donc, euh, il y a... madame la rapporteure, il faut attendre encore. Il y a madame Célic qui... qui a réussi à se connecter. Donc, on va terminer avec madame Célic. Et puis, euh, vous, de Turquie, puis vous aurez ensuite la parole. C'est à vous, Madame Tilik. Vous avez un, un point d'ordre euh, Deux minutes, pardon, Madame Tilik. Il y a une motion d'ordre. Je vous écoute. Uh, I want to mention that the occupation authorities deny Crimeans the right to receive education in their native language. And the number of children who receive education in Ukrainian has dramatically uh, decreased. Uh, only 3%, can you imagine, only 3% of school Attendez, children studying non, in the Crimean ce, ce Tatar language. Ce n'est pas une motion On va no être obligé de vous couper. Euh, j'entends bien ce que vous dites et ce que vous voulez dire. Ce ne sont pas des, des rappels au règlement. Euh, nous allons maintenant laisser la parole à Madame Selig, qui est notre dernière oratrice avant que, euh, l'ora- avant que la rapporteure prenne la parole. C'est à vous, Madame Selig. Dear President, dear colleagues, I would like to thank the reporter for this excellent work. Respecting linguistic, ethnic, cultural diversity of national minorities are key for preserving pluralistic and inclusive democracies. I would like to elaborate on some of the emerging and existing challenges in this respect. First of all, as stated in the report, some European nations started a process of resecuritization of minority rights, which leads to the emergence of a pattern of discrimination in criminal justice, intelligence and police work in such countries. This pattern further restricts minority rights and creates stereotypes endangering the social multi-ethnic fabric of the member states. The attempt to restrict religious freedoms of certain national minorities in France became almost a showcase of this situation. The anti-radicalization bill approved by the French parliament effectively legalized Islamophobia, which will serve very much against the bill's stated purpose. It's important to emphasize that there has recently been a significant increase in hate crimes against national minorities in Europe. In Germany alone, there were 122 attacks on mosques in 2020, a significant amount of which were attributed to politically motivated crimes by far-right groups. Member states should take necessary measures to provide the security of their national minorities instead of adopting discriminatory policies and fueling hate crimes. Secondly, as mentioned by the report, we have recently seen the emergence of a new wave of populist and far-right nationalist discourse in European politics. As opposed to this discourse rising from bottom-up, we see certain state leaders and politicians instrumentally feeding this discourse top-down to to win elections. More importantly, in countries like France, in addition to the populist political rhetoric, we witnessed the government adopting discriminatory policies, violating the rights of certain national minorities. Moreover, as stated by many human rights organizations, the anti-immigration, white supremacist, anti-Semitic and Islamophobic discourse and hate crimes of right-wing groups gained a new momentum during the COVID-19 pandemic. The cumulative effect of the discourses and attacks of far-right groups and the discriminatory policies of populist governments generates a significant crisis for the multicultural dimension of European societies, which is a matter of great concern. Finally, in addition to these emerging challenges, there exist decades-long violations in some member states. For instance, the Turkish minority in Western Trace 
has been denied their identity, religious and educational rights for decades, despite bilateral and international treaties. They face several problems in the field of education, such as the lack of bilingual kindergartens and the closing down of minority elementary schools. Greece was sentenced by the European Court of Human Rights three times for denying the existence of the Turkish minority, but it refuses to comply. We need a stronger dialogue to resolve these emerging and existing issues, and I believe that PACE is a vital platform for an enhancing the dialogue that we look for. Thank you very much. Merci, Madame. Maintenant, je vais passer la parole à notre rapporteur. Je suis désolée d'avoir comme ça fait déborder la séance, mais enfin, on m'y a un peu aidé, je dois dire. Euh, Madame Kovacs, vous avez trois minutes, mais si vous aviez moins que trois minutes, ça irait aussi, <rire> si vous voulez bien euh, prendre la parole. Merci à vous. Thank you, distinguished chair, dear colleagues, thank you for this really constructive debate and all of the nice and not so nice words um, I heard uh, during this debate. First of all, I would like to focus that about 340 indigenous national minorities live and operate in 47 European countries, which is more than 100 million people. So that means that every seventh inhabitant of the continent is a member of a national minority or an ethnic group. And this report is about them. I understand the concern for Roma, but our committee uh, has already done a lot of reports about Roma, and we even have one in the phase of uh, preparation. So this is not a uh, focus in the topic of uh, this report. I hope that most of us, uh, some not, but now where, um, uh, see the importance of understanding that minority rights as um, more than uh, simply, it, this, these are more than uh, individual rights. For minority rights to be effective, their collective dimension must be protected too. I'm convinced, and this is the situation in my own home country, Serbia, since we have the collective dimension of minority rights in our constitution. Um, I personally have been strengthened after this debate in my conviction that, uh, as we could hear from most of you, that the dialogue is the crucial piece in this puzzle. And I, I got renewed hope that um, where all sides participate in a dialogue in good faith, progress can be, of course, uh, achieved. Uh, I would like to underline key lessons I have learned during the work and uh, after the debate and uh, um, in the last um, few years. The defining element of an integrated society is not the sameness of the citizens, but their shared sense of belonging. This is the best guarantee of peace, stability and democratic security that everyone, whether they belong to a minority or to the majority, needs to in order to flourish uh, in their everyday life. Furthermore, by fostering pluralistic and inclusive societies in which persons belonging to national minorities are able to express both their multiple identities and their loyalty to the democratic constitutional principles, we are contributing to Europe, which is united in diversity. Uh, once again, I want to thank, uh, say a big thank to all of you who took part in the debate, who have been working in this report in, uh, for the last uh, two years, for my colleagues from the Committee on Equality and Non-Discrimination for their contribution and other colleagues uh, to uh, for the secretariat of course for the tremendous work um, thank you for the invitation to wales indeed i had some um, online meetings also with ukrainian and welsh uh, authorities hopefully this situation will be better and we can work differently and at the beginning i must say that i want to say a huge thank to my national delegation because despite the fact it is almost eight o'clock now even the speaker of the parliament is uh, here with us. Thank you for your attention. Merci. Est-ce que la présidente de la commission, Petra Bayer, vous souhaitez intervenir, s'il vous plaît C'est à vous. Thank you very much, Mrs. President. When we will commemorate uh, um, later in, in May this year, the liberation of the Austrian concentration camp um, Mauthausen, the theme will be demolished diversity. And exactly that it was, what was the goal of the Nazi regime to extinguish diversity, to extinguish human beings when they had other beliefs, other origin, other, other religion, another language or another 
um, sexual orientation or gender identity. With its framework convention, the Council of Europe built the the fundaments, the, 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 yeah, the fundament, the, the foundations for the protection of minorities, also for national minorities, of course. And we know that when rights of minorities are under pressure, then it often appears when, for instance, um, it's pretended to protect the national security, and that's the reason why we have to diminish them. In times of crisis, minority rights are often taken hostages and uh, not guaranteed anymore. We should follow the spirit of Elvira Kovac's report and uphold the rights of national minorities. And it is an important contribution for the stability of every country, country itself, I think. And it's also important not to consider it as a cherry on the cream, but as a fundamental human right, even or especially in times of crisis. I want to congratulate Elvira and uh, also uh, join the applause she got for this really very good report. And also, uh, um, on behalf of the committee, I can say that I'm really very much looking forward, hopefully soon, to debate a new report from Frantische Kopschiva, our chair of the subcommittee for minorities on Roma uh, and travelers here in this assembly. Thank you very much. Merci à vous. La discussion générale est donc close. La Commission sur l'égalité et la non-discrimination a présenté un projet de résolution et un projet de recommandation sur lequel aucun amendement n'a été déposé. Nous allons comme faire le vote désormais sur le projet de résolution avec une majorité simple requise. Euh, les membres présents voteront en se servant du système de vote de l'hémicycle et les membres participants à distance se serviront du système de vote à distance. Le scrutin est ouvert dans l'hémicycle et à distance. C'est bon C'est bon Le scrutin est clos, je demande l'affichage du résultat. Le projet de résolution est adopté. Nous allons maintenant procéder au vote sur le projet de recommandation contenu dans le document 15231. Je vous rappelle que la majorité requise est celle des deux tiers des suffrages exprimés. Le scrutin est ouvert dans l'hémicycle et à distance. Le scrutin est clos, je demande l'affichage du résultat. Le projet de recommandation contenu dans le document 15231 est adopté car la majorité des deux tiers est réunie. Je vous remercie. La prochaine séance publique aura lieu demain matin à 9h, conformément à l'ordre du jour de la présente partie de session. La séance est levée. Bonne soirée et bravo à la rapporteure. Oui, et mille excuses aux interprètes qui ont dû rester plus longtemps pour travailler avec nous. Merci à vous.